Firstly, I'll just say has been largely brought together by uh, Ben Smith from my team, who you'll hear from later, as well as Dee, Candice, Charlotte from here, who have done an outstanding job of organising. And Melissa, thank you from the Newcastle group as well. Um, have done a really great job of pulling this together. What we're going to hear about today is really one of the big challenges. I think, um, you know, while we can all think about interventions and testing efficacy, etc., how do we think about implementing them in practice and researching that? What model do we apply? What frameworks do we apply? I think we all grapple with that. Um, I've been one of those people, so I'm looking forward to hearing from uh, Liz Eakin, who's our I guest speaker today, but also from a number of case studies that um, are quite diverse case studies you'll see from the program um, about how they thought about what framework to implement, etc. So there will be opportunity for a panel discussion later, so if you have um, questions as we go or things that you want to raise with the panel, maybe just note them so that we can do that at the end. Um, but firstly, I will introduce our, our guest speaker today, Elizabeth Eakin, who's a, a lovely friend and colleague who I've known for a, a couple of decades now, I think. Oops. Um, so Liz has come down from, from Queensland. She's an implementation scientist. Um, she's currently Associate Dean for Research in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Queensland. Uh, but she's also been Director of the Cancer Prevention Research Centre for a, a long, long time. A long, long time, Liz. <laughs> and that's where we first got to know each other. Um, Liz is internationally renowned for her research, particularly in the area of uh, physical activity and nutrition. Um, She's held NHMRC fellowships for many years and uh, is really a wonderful role model, I think, for young researchers as well as uh, others who are working in the implementation space, etc. So I will hand over to Liz to um, talk to us. And yes, all of those are acknowledgements up there. Sorry, I should have put that up first. Thank you, everybody who's on that screen. And over to you, Liz. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, and um, hello, Hunter. It's nice to have you with us as well. Um, I'd like to just start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and um, pay respect to elders past, present, emerging, um, as well as those who are with us today. Thank you. Um, okay. So I'm going to be talking to you about our Healthy Living After um, Cancer project because it's, it's very much um, an implementation project and one in which we're applying a, a particular evaluation framework, the REAIN framework, so we'll be um, focusing some more on that today. Thank you. Um, so when I was talking to Ben, and um, lest you think Ben is being rude, he's actually there tweeting. <laughs> so he's, he's multitasking and, and tweeting about um, yeah, all, all the things I guess we'll be talking about today. Um, but when I was talking to Ben about um, what he wanted for this particular talk, what he's, he's asked me to do is to address the um, experience of our team in, in developing this project, um, why we chose the REAIM evaluation framework in particular, how we use it in the context of the project, and then to talk about some of the um, challenges in, in implementing it. So. We'll, We'll see how we go covering all of those. Um, and pardon, some of those slides are, are a bit squished just with different screen formats that we have, I think, throughout the day. Um, but what I'm going to do is just start by, I'll, I'll give you an overview of, of the Healthy Living After Cancer project, and then we'll talk about how it was developed and, and the application of the, of the framework. So just by way of a, a bit of background, um, this project is funded by an NHMRC um, partnership project grant. Um, our partners are the cancer councils, um, most of the major ones across the country that, that you see here, including Cancer Council New South Wales, which is fantastic. Um, in, in a nutshell, in this project, what we're doing is integrating an evidence-based telephone health coaching program. So a program on which we've worked for, you know, for many years in the context of, of randomized control trials um, and, and, and now have good evidence um, of its efficacy and effectiveness. So we're, we're working with the cancer councils now to integrate this program into their 13, 11, 20 information support, um, support and information service, which used to be called the, the health line. So very much about implementing something that's been shown to be effective in, in, uh, in research, 
working with partners to, to now implement it in, in practice and, um, and across the country. Okay, so there's a very large um, team of people who sit um, behind uh, this, this project and then work closely with us. So these are the names I'm sure that you're all familiar with, um, including APA, who's been a part of the project from the beginning, uh, as well as some of our international colleagues. One of the things that's really, really nice about this partnership project mechanism, well, there are a number of things that are really great about it, but um, it actually allows you to acknowledge your, your partners as in formal investigators on the grant. And so you can see that we have colleagues from, from each of our cancer councils formally listed as associate investigators, really appropriate and, and in keeping with their, um, their contribution to the work. Just a few photos of the wonderful staff, um, our, our own project coordinator who sits with me in Brisbane, but of the staff and the cancer councils across the country who really are on the ground making this project happen. Um, okay, and again, and by, by way of just very brief explanation, the Healthy Living After Cancer program um, involves six months of telephone health coaching. The program is delivered entirely by uh, nurses and, and consultants at, at the cancer councils. It's available to any adult um, treated with any type of cancer uh, as, as long as they're in the post-treatment phase and, and have been treated with curative intent. And the focus is weight loss, healthy eating, uh, sorry, moderate weight loss, healthy eating, physical, uh, physical activity. Uh, and it's, it's based very much around these evidence-based guidelines. Sorry, I know that the text is probably a bit small there, but guidelines for healthy living and cancer survivors that have been um, endorsed by Cancer Council and have been endorsed by uh, cancer organizations here and, and really um, in, internationally. So the protocol um, is, is really quite straightforward. The important part to note about this is that each of these steps is conducted um, within and, and by the Cancer Council. So we've worked carefully with them to train uh, and, and support their staff to, to conduct each of these steps in the protocol. So, um, patients can either um, self-refer or be referred by a clinician into the program um, in, in each of these four states. They're then screened and, and consented um, over the telephone um, at the cancer councils. Cancer councils also conduct over the telephone a pre-program assessment. So we get a, a baseline take of, of um, where people are at in terms of their lifestyle behaviors, as well as some additional information about their cancer and, and, and any other chronic conditions. They um, then receive the six month uh, uh, Healthy Living After Cancer program, again, delivered um, by Cancer Council nurses and, and consultants. And then they undergo the, the post program assessment at, at six months. And um, although we weren't initially funded to do it, we now have a PhD student working on the project. And so she's conducting a, a 12 month assessment. So we're able to look at some longer term um, outcomes as well. Okay, so um, I'm going to just show a video that, that gives you just a, a little snippet of, um, of what the program uh, looks and feels like. Just very brief. Mm -hmm. That's good. So today I thought we'd start by talking a little bit more about how the program works and what you most like to get out of it. So how does that sound? Excellent. So have you got the workbook that I sent out there with you? Okay, great. Uh, so as we spoke about, I'll be bringing you regularly over the next six months to help you get where you'd like to be in terms of your diet and exercise goals. So what I might do is I'll get you to start by telling me just a little bit more about you. Um, so when did you finish your treatment, Jenny? Okay, and, and what type of diet and exercise routine would you say you had at the moment? Definitely. Sure, that, that's a really normal place to be in, and we often hear from people that it can be really hard to get back on track after your treatment stops, and that's absolutely okay. So what we might do is we'll talk about some of the small steps that you can start taking now to get back on track. All right, great. So have you got chapter one open there in front of you? Fantastic. Okay, great. And what I'd like to so that gives you a, a, a little uh, flavor of, of the program. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna turn to the things that Ben has asked me to um, address and, and talk about how we developed the projects in, in the first place. Um, I will walk you through some of the more concrete steps, but, but there's actually a story that, um, that underpins this. So I'll, I'll start with the story and, and keep it as, as brief as possible. Um, this wasn't the actual project that we set out to, to try to get funded and have this been a part of this for, for a very long time. 
this group of investigators that you saw listed on the screen, we were actually trying for a number of years to get funded to do kind of the, what's the holy grail of a trial in, in this area. Um, we wanted to do a, a trial of, of uh, an exercise intervention in breast cancer that would follow a large enough group of women and follow them long enough that we could actually evaluate the um, impact on, on their survival. So, you know, quality of life and other things that are obviously very, very important. But, um, but, but survival was showing that, that an exercise intervention could impact survival was, you know, really, really the purpose of, of what this trial was to be about. We tried for many years to, to get this kind of trial funded. The very um, last time we tried, we put an application forward to the National Breast Cancer Foundation. We made it all the way to interview. And at interview, the, the panel said to us, look, you know, well, well, um, well developed trial, appropriate methodology, we don't have a problem with it from that standpoint. We just don't think this trial needs to be done. We, we think there's enough evidence about the impact and the good of, of exercise for, for people with cancer, for women with breast cancer. Um, we think what's important now is implementation. We, you know, we don't think you need, to, again, that trial would have taken at least 10 years to conduct and, and see those outcomes of trial longer. We don't want to wait 10 years. We, we want this stuff implemented now. And we went, wow, okay. <laughs> um, so we, we took that to heart and, um, the steps that we, we followed were, were these then, because we'd been doing a lot of work on, um, on telephone delivered interventions because of their ability to have greater reach. Um, we, we then said, well, who can we partner with to, to actually implement it and get this, this kind of program into practice? And so um, we looked for a partner who um, had the infrastructure to deliver this telephone-based health coaching, as well as the, the mandate to provide support for cancer survivors. And you know, obviously, um, cancer councils were, were a very logical partner in that sense. Um, and what I did was literally to fly around the country and meet with each of the cancer councils and, and just start some discussion to say, you know, here's the evidence. And it wasn't only evidence from our trials or you know, people here, many people here in Australia doing work in this space. There are lots of people internationally. So there's a very large evidence base supporting the type of, um, of, of outcomes and improvements that, that accrue to people with cancer um, from this type of lifestyle intervention. So we, you know, we put all that together and went around and had these discussions. And um, the, the reception was, was just phenomenal. The you know, vast majority of cancer councils said, you know, yes, yes, this is the type of programming we want for our cancer survivors. We very much like the fact that it's delivered over the telephone because we have a statewide um, mandate. Um, and, and so, you know, kind of away we went from, from there. We, um, you know, then mustered our entire group of investigators again. Um, we held a concept development workshop, which was um, sponsored by POCOG and, and PC4, very thankfully. Um, we put together this NHMRC project um, partnership act application, and we were funded the, the first time around and, and thus the, the project. So that's a long-winded story, but I mean, each of you working in the implementation space would have those stories of, of the, the time that it takes and the relationships that have to be developed for this, this kind of thing to, to come together. Okay, well, the re-aim framework then, um, switching finally to, to talking about frameworks. Um, most of you would, would probably be familiar um, with this framework. We had a very nice paper that was um, made available to us as part of this conference. It was a, a lovely overview of the different frameworks. So even if you weren't familiar with re-aim, prior, you, you would have <clears throat> excuse me, seen that in the paper. You would also know that REAIN is an evaluation framework, um, and, and that's the um, way or context in which we're using it in this study. But um, very briefly, REAIN helps us to focus on, on, on the reach or what percentage of the target population we, we are able to, to tap into with a given project. Effectiveness, of course, so, so what, are the, what are the outcomes that are true to, um, to participants? Um, adoption, what, what about the settings, it might be clinicians, it might be community organizations, um, how, how many of those or what percentage are, are actually taking it up and implementing it. Implementation itself, so is the program implemented as it was intended in a per protocol sense? And then um, maintenance, so maintenance, um, the REAIM framework talks about it at, at two levels for those of you who know it, one at the individual level are the, in this case, behaviors, individual behaviors maintained over time but also at the systems or, or partner level. So do, do the organizations continue to deliver the program over time? There's um, a wonderful Reaim website. There are you know, umpteen million um, <clears throat> Reaim publications now, so plenty of, of information out there. Um, as to why we chose it, uh, 
<clears throat> in, in part that's um, in part personal. I actually from the US uh, originally, which I'm sure is obvious, but I trained with Russ in Glasgow as, as a postdoc and spent quite a number of years working with him. So whether I liked it or not, Rian was, was built into my head, but, but I've always found it to be just a, a very pragmatic framework. And, and I like it from that sense. It's, it's, it's adaptable, it's not overly prescriptive. So it, you really have to know your setting and your context and, and apply it, you know, apply the broad Rian dimensions with, bringing what you know to, to the table. And I like it in that sense. But the other thing about it, and I think the reason why it's particularly well suited to this implementation context is because it really does a good job of balancing internal and, and external validity. So internal validity really meaning the methodologic rigor that, that we need to bring to every evaluation, whether it be randomized control trial or you know, pre-post design or just single point in time evaluation in, a, in an implementation setting. We need to be as rigorous as, as we can in that evaluation. And if, if we want to know about you know, whether those results are going to generalize, then, then we do need to be mindful of a whole set of other factors related to external validity. And so that is really what the REIN framework brings in. Issues like adoption, issues like implementation, issues like, like reach. So that may be be very soapboxy on my part, but at least I've given you the, the bias for, for where I've come from. It, it is a framework I've worked with for probably three, um, three decades now. Um, it's, as you've seen from the, the overview um, paper we got, it, it's not the only one, it's not the be all and, and, and end all, but um, it's one that's, that's worked quite well for, for us. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, how we actually apply the aim in, in, in the context of this Healthy Living After Cancer project. Um, so this is an implementation study. It's a single group pre-post design. Um, the process outcomes here are our primary outcomes in this project. So we're interested in where referrals are coming from. So the reach dimension, we're interested in who's taking part. So not only reach, but the representativeness of, of people taking part. And we're certainly interested in whether cancer councils can implement this intervention as, as part of their um, service delivery. So implementation, all, all of these re um, dimensions. Participant reported outcomes are, are important, but in this project, we've, we've pitched them as secondary outcomes. So um, what, what benefits do participants achieve um, and then maintain over time? And we're also fortunate enough to be working with a health economist, so we will conduct some, some economic analysis around this as, as well. So that's a, an overview. I'll be more specific then as, as to what we're measuring for some of these. Um, and, and really, this, this you know, single slide sums up the re dimensions and, and the indicators that we're measuring. So it is, in, in one sense, as, as simple as, as this, of course, when it underlies it, it's the challenge and logistics of actually collecting data that speak to each one of these, and I'll, I'll come to that under challenges. But you can see, again, in terms of reach, we're, we're tracking referrals and referral sources, um, participant characteristics, um, I'll show you a slide on our patient reported or effectiveness <laughs> outcomes. Um, you know, talked about adoptions, so not hard in this case to, to track how many cancer councils we spoke to and how many are actually participating. Um, but really importantly, we have lots and lots of, of indicators of, of implementation. And, and that's, that's the crux of this, to know if it's actually feasible for cancer councils to, um, to deliver. So, um, you know, we're interested in, in how many people are actually deemed eligible after screening, consent rates, number of calls they're able to deliver, the duration of calls, how many people complete the program, and conversely withdrawal, if they withdraw, why they're withdrawing, um, participant and staff satisfaction, tracking the cost, the, the resource um, that it takes to, to deliver the program, um, and then maintenance as well. So maintenance of the 12-month follow-up that we talked about, um, as well as um, taking a look at, at whether and how many of the cancer councils might choose to continue delivering the program after the uh, formal project ends. Um, so I'm going to share with you kind of our, our preliminary, because we're still very much in the field, the preliminary results on these, and, and then we'll come to well, what are some of the challenges in, in, in actually collecting those, those data and, and implementing the, the framework. Um, so uh, adoption was fairly easy. As I said, to assess, we approached um, all five of the major cancer councils across the country, and, and four of them agreed to participate. Um, 
in terms of reach and representativeness, so this is a snapshot of the first 200 or so um, people who have come through the program. And um, even though we've had over, over 700 come through the date, I'm showing you these baseline data for 203 because I'm also going to show you the effectiveness data, that the six-month data for, um, for the same group. So you can see here that um, there are people with a wide variety of, of cancers who take part, which is really been a, a good thing. I mean, you'll, if you look down, you'll quickly notice that with nearly 90% female, you can figure out that the majority are, are women with, with breast cancer. And um, that's not surprising in that women, um, and, and particularly women with breast cancer, are, are generally a bit more an, an activated group, more seeking in terms of preventative um, care, and more likely to use a telephone-based program. We know that from, um, from the broader literature. But it's, it's really great, and the cancer councils are particularly happy, as are we, to see a wider variety of, of people with, uh, well, with a wider variety of cancers taking part. For many of these, with those, some of the less common cancers have said, you know, we're so happy to actually have something. It's, it's hard, as you well know, for people with less common cancers to find support groups or, or, or programs or, or any types of support. So um, this, this has been a good thing. The other um, characteristics there are, I think, largely as you would expect for a group of um, for cancer survivors and being somewhat older, um, having higher uh, levels of, of BMI. We were also pleased to see um, people closer to the time of diagnosis with, within a couple years because, again, we're, we're trying to target that earlier post-treatment phase. Um, and the other thing, I guess, looking at the fact that 25% of, of this group of participants has come from regional or rural areas, um, again, with a telephone-delivered program, that's, that's something we're really encouraging the cancer councils to, um, to, to push as its, its ability to provide support to people living outside of metropolitan areas. So that's, love it to be higher, but it's, it's certainly good, good to see. Um, so implementation, and again, this is from just over 700 referrals into the program to date. So the first thing we looked at is, well, what percentage of people are, are screened um, eligible in, into the program? We're, we're happy with this, this rate of screening. Um, you know, eligibility is, is one of those things where, I guess, particularly for this type of program that involves un, unsupervised physical activity, safety is, is, of course, paramount with that. But, but you don't want your screening to be so strict that the majority of people get, you know, get, get screened out. And, and so this, I, I think, um, for, for us achieves, a, achieves a, a good benefit. If you look all the way to the bottom then under ad, adverse outcomes, you can see, again, to date, we, we've not had any, any adverse outcomes reported. So if we go back up to, um, to program uptake. Again, the majority of people who are screened eligible are, are participating. That's not surprising in that they've you know, self-selected to, to, to show interest in, in the program. But nonetheless, that's, that's nice to see. Median calls. Um, the protocol calls for, for 12 calls, although that is somewhat flexible and it is ultimately negotiated between participant and, and nurse. Um, but that's very, very close to protocol as a median, so that's fantastic. The length of calls there at, at 30 minutes um, is a little bit longer than we, we were hoping. The nurses would target something a little bit closer to, to 20 minutes, but um, if you've ever talked to a, a cancer council nurse, they are very thorough and in what they do, they're very passionate about this program. And, and um, again, we're okay with that if, if they're okay with that. Um, program completion rates, that, that you know, at about 60% might might be somewhat surprising. Um, it's It's, Unfortunately, not surprising for this type of free telephone service. So if any of you are familiar with the, um, the Get Healthy service that's um, <coughs> promoted here in, in New South Wales as a free population-wide um, telephone health coaching service, very similar rates of completion or by converse um, dropout. Um, that is just one of the uh, drawbacks of, of this type of program. Okay, and sorry, that's... Um, it, it is probably a bit difficult to see, but, but these are our effectiveness or patient reported outcomes. So this is looking at um, what we've done is, is to calculate the standardized improvement from baseline to six months to the end of the program across all of our outcomes, which are listed down the left. And you can see there what the specific measures were. On the far right, you can actually see the change in the, in the actual scale unit. But what we've done for comparison is the standardized score, very similar to, a, to an effect size. So we can see where we have small, medium, or large effects across all of these. And, and the, you know, the take-home message is that we are seeing statistically significant improvements in all, in all of these um, outcomes, and, and some of them at a, at a quite reasonable um, level, 
you know, in, in particular, I guess, for our targets of physical activity and, and fruit and vegetables and, and weight, um, we're, we're certainly happy to see that, but, but as well, the, the quality of life scores and uh, uh, fear of cancer recurrence. So across the board, um, we're very pleased to see these types of improvements for people. Now, noting that you know, they're self-reported in, in improvements, they um, probably couldn't be otherwise for these, except, um, except for being able to, to measure weight clinically if we were able to, um, but, but good improvements. Um, so if we look at maintenance now, um, and again, the kind of a lot going on in this graph, but these are the same patient reported outcomes. Um, and if you look across the bottom, we've, so we've got baseline six months where we saw improvements in all of them. So that's, that's the, the 100% there. And, and really what this graph is looking at is then at the 12 month point, how are these outcomes either maintained or, or starting to drop off? And you can see, although it's hard to get the specifics for each one, you can see there's quite quite variation in either the maintenance or, or, or starting to receive for um, for all of these outcomes. Um, so what it you know what it tells us is, is that we do need to be mindful of, of the issue of, of maintenance and and look to provide some additional support if we can. And I will come um, come back to that at, at the end. And how are we going for time? I should be close to finishing up. Five minutes. Okay. Um, okay, well, maintenance at the systems level or at the level of cancer councils, well, too early to, to tell um, yet, but we are starting to have those discussions as we approach the last year, year and a half of, of the program with the cancer councils. Really here, our, our goal for the program is not, for the project, it's, it's not so much about accruing an exact number of, of participants. It's working with the cancer councils so that they, each of them, have enough experience in delivering the program and then have the you know, outcomes that, that they can, can look at um, and, and evaluate with us so that they can then say, you know, yes, this is something we want to continue or, or no, we don't. So it's really about each, each one of them having enough experience rather than saying we, we need an end of a thousand people um, to, to make this project successful. Um, okay, so I said we did collect some data and, and we'll continue to collect some data on both staff, that is nurse satisfaction um, as well as patient satisfaction. So the nurses have by and large really enjoyed um, taking part in this project. You can see the, um, some of the, the comments from them, the fact that they're able to apply the coaching that, that they've learned um, to other areas. I, I didn't get a chance to talk about the training, but that, that might be something we come back to in, in panel discussion. Um, certainly they, they've gotten a lot of increased knowledge about exercise and nutrition through the, the training in this project. And many of them, you know, really walking the talk now in their own lives and finding that that makes them better able um, to, to do the health coaching of, of the um, participants they're speaking to. So we'll just take a quick look at um, a, a video of some uh, participant comment. Hi, my name is Tina. I recently finished the Healthy Living After a Cancer Program. And I wanted to share with you some of the benefits. When I support the latest Cancer Council, my diet has become much healthier. I've been able to develop an exercise plan that works for me. I feel healthier and happier than I have in a long time, and knowing I'm contributing to my own good health is incredibly empowering. I can't sing the praises of this program enough. It's made a huge difference to my life. So for, for us, and that was not scripted in any way, um, she performs a great comment. I mean, particularly about her own empowerment, which was, you know, really, really what about. Um, okay, so finish up with some challenges then. Um, uh, and, and really, these, these challenges aren't, aren't specific to the REAIM evaluation framework. They're, they're really just about the, the context of implementation that, that you, know, you all know very, very well. So it, you know, it's about research in a service delivery context. Um, and the, the challenge, you, you saw the whole list of implementation indicators that, that we're working with the cancer councils to, to collect. And so um, you know, I guess the first point there is that it is about negotiating with them a, a collaborative evaluation um, frame. So there, you know, the things that we know we need to report on based on the, the project we, we propose to the NHMRC, but it's also about making sure that the cancer councils are, are getting the data that, that they need to help inform their decisions about um, service delivery. Those two things weren't so far apart. It's just that, uh, you know, not surprisingly, as, as researchers, there was a fair bit of additional detail that we were after that they probably would have been happy not to, not to have to collect. Um, and 
concretely, what um, we we had a lot of challenges in terms of the database. Um, we we wanted to to build a database that would make it easy for the cancer councils to collect the data and, and input it. They didn't want that. They they each wanted to because they're delivering this through the 13, 11, 20 service, which you know has its own database. They wanted to incorporate this into their database and and collect the data as as they want. Ultimately, that's great, and that it, you know it's their ownership of the program it really does tell them then you know how feasible it is for them to deliver so we were really happy with that but each one of them has a different database and different capabilities to adapt to, to collect what was needed so there was a lot of work um, in, involved in that ultimately I do think it was the right um, right decision and would certainly have respected their decision on that regardless but um, a lot of a lot of challenges um, again I won't belabor the point too much longer but um, the bottom line of this is, is that we have a full-time project manager who, who sits with me in Brisbane. The majority of her time is spent needing to um, to do data checking and, and, and chasing up because of the differences across databases and needs to needing to recode. And so it's it's time intensive to get good good data from um, from this this type of study. Again, as you would well know. So um, on the implementation side, it, it's not all easy for the nurses. And so this is some um, some additional feedback from them. The protocol is, is a complex one. It's it's ultimately a clinical interaction. There was a lot of new material on exercise and, and nutrition for them to learn, um, and it, it just took you know took some some time that that training and they're getting gaining comfort with it. Um, the logistics because they're used to working in a service that just has a single incoming call. This is a service where they follow the same person for a number of calls over six months. So very very different different way of, of delivering a service. They're switching hats between um, the, the 13, 11, 20 service and delivering this, this program, although some of them liked that. Um, and, and then how to deal with psychosocial issues in the context of, of this program where um, you know, normally they might be just referring them out. So it's some, some real challenges. Um, and then finally, I said, um, we are addressing the issue of maintenance. So at the top is, is Jenny Job, and she's our PhD student, um, and she's um, working with Brie Feltso, who's the picture on the bottom. She's a fellow in, in our center. Brie has developed a text messaging intervention that's about prov um, providing ongoing maintenance for, for this type of lifestyle program. It's actually now part of the regular um, Get Healthy service in, in New South Wales. That's where our research um, kind of started with, with this program, Breeze Research. Um, and so Jenny's now taking that and adapting that to be the maintenance component of, of healthy living after cancer. So it's, it's an exciting project for us. And as you've seen, we, we do need to be addressing the issue of maintenance. Um, so final, final thoughts. It really is all, all about the partnerships. It's, it's you know it's really important for us here to engage the cancer councils not only from the outset but but on an ongoing basis. If we have regular meetings and regular reporting to them um, on, a, on a monthly basis, um, the capacity building aspect for their nurses, both around evaluation um, and, and program delivery, has, has been another um, another important aspect. And then finally, I just I can't say enough. Excuse me about how wonderful that the cancer councils have been as as partners in this. Um, you know, not only did they have the infrastructure we needed, they're fortunate enough to have their you know their own funding for service delivery and and for research. But the, the culture of evidence based practice that, that exists uh, amongst the cancer councils, and I see a lot of nods, is, is just um, they really walk that talk, and it's really been a pleasure to work with. All right, thank you. Time maybe for a couple of questions. Would that be okay if anyone's got any questions? And that, I'm sure that includes Hunter as well. So yeah. Thanks very much, Liz. Um, <laughs> um, you spoke about the strengths of Reaim from your perspective in terms of clinical validity, and that it wasn't too you know, prescriptive. I'm just wondering what were some of the limitations in your experience from using that to underpin your um, work? I, I mean, I, I suppose others have spoken to the, the limitations of that. I, I, basically, I don't really find any in, in that. I think there's there's no reason you can't add additional indicators. There's, there's no reason you can't combine it with another framework. It's, it's just not 
to me, none of this field is, is that rigid. It's about finding the frameworks that work, maybe taking the best elements of, of multiple of multiple frameworks on in, in that sense. And that's probably a bit about my approach to evaluation as well in this context, but, it, but I just think it's about finding what works for a given context. Or, you know, reading, reading is, is just a part of that. I, I don't know, do you have some specific thoughts on that or? No, no, I was just wondering if you needed to adapt it in some manner or if it, if it didn't quite fit the context or if it was, yeah, just based on your experience, would you adapt it or? Make some modifications to it. Yeah, I mean, not not as a broad framework because really you you uh, because you are adapting it as you apply it to any context. You know, it's 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 not always possible to address all of the dimensions. Sometimes you can't get you know maintenance data. You're not able to follow people for that long. Sometimes you're you're not you know adoption isn't relevant to the context because you're only working with one you know one organization. So, but but again, that's. Kind of just applying it in, in context more than a limitation, I think. It's a good question. And I wonder if we might actually address that after we've heard about the other mm -hmm. frameworks as well, and maybe, you know, way yeah, up. Yeah, pose and maybe pose and pose. Just a quick question. Um, um, thank you, Liz. Uh, I just was wondering, if, I'm not sure if I missed it, but when you said the indicators um, for the process of the success, how much were they actually uh, informed by? Of the ultimate customer, the, the consumer, the, the patient. I mean, you talked a lot about the cancer council was basically um, um, very helpful, but did some of these indicators actually come directly from the, from the patients and the survivors? Yeah, no, really, really good question. I, I didn't touch on that um, at all, but I mean, like, like, you know, pretty much all of us doing work in, in this space, we have um, cancer advocates taking part in, in the project. Um, and, and they were, you know, part and parcel of, of informing its development and, and informing evaluation and reviewing protocols. So, yeah. And we just have a question from the council. Good. Oh, she's just sending it through. This is where in the back. Hi, Dan. And Elizabeth. Yeah. Um, we we're wondering, uh, do you have any soft studies built into the project? Um, objective measures of the outcomes, for example, accelerometry for physical activity. Objective measures, I didn't hear the last time. So again, the, the, um, <clears throat> the randomized trials evidence base that sits behind this, um, particularly the exercise studies, a number of them would certainly include an objective measurement of, of physical activity. In the implementation space, that's a lot more challenging. Would you know? Would we have loved to put accelerometers or, or you know pedometers on on people? Absolutely. Um, but but the resources involved in doing that in this kind of context, where the you know people are taking part across the country, um, we we deemed yeah not possible. But but also in this context, really not not needed. We do have that evidence from from the trials literature and that this isn't about establishing the validity of, of the measurement. This is this is about taking measurements, self-report measurements that we know to be valid and, and really applying them where the, those outcomes are in fact secondary for, for us. But it would be fantastic if you know that kind of measurement could be incorporated. All right. I think we might have to wrap up just um, to break for morning tea. Thank you so yep. much, Liz, and we'll we'll be back after morning tea to hear about the case studies. So <laughs> thank you. those barriers is that health providers are not providing them with good support. So they're not providing good evidence-based smoking cessation care to pregnant women. So we wanted an intervention that focuses on the health providers and basically aims to improve how health providers manage smoking in Aboriginal medical services to pregnant women. And we designed a multi-component intervention that includes both webinar training, so three sessions of one hour webinar training to improve the health provider's skills and knowledge, including an educational resource package that was de developed collaboratively with two Aboriginal medical services and tested across three other Aboriginal medical services that includes both resources for the health providers, resources for the pregnant women, and a resource that is for a joint consultation, sort of guiding the, the health provider during the consultation. 
providing the services also with free oral nicotine replacement therapy. So nicotine replacement therapy is recommended if a pregnant woman isn't able to quit on her own. And this is a barrier because it's not subsidized on the PBS. So giving the services that and also audit and feedback on the health providers, whether they prescribe nicotine replacement therapy, because that's one of the things that was found that they don't actually prescribe it to patients. Um, so I'm just going to give a brief sort of overview on the behavior change wheel and then hand it over to uh, Jillian to talk more about how we use that to design the intervention. So the behavior change wheel, it was uh, basically comes from the University of College London. It's by a group led by Susan Mickey that I'm assuming a lot of you know. Um, and they sort of looked at other behavior change frameworks and tested them sort of, do they include all the things we think should include a framework that talks about behavior change? And they said, they're all good, but sort of each one is lacking in something. And so that they did a synthesis of 19 behavior change interventions to try and come up with a, a framework that includes everything that they thought should be included in this framework. And the basis of this framework is the COMB model, which basically says that in order to change a behavior, the first thing you have to do is first of all, motivation, but you also need capability and opportunity. So both influence motivation and all three influence whether you can change the behavior and if doing the behavior itself also influences back the capability, opportunity and motivation. So that's basically in the center of the behavior change wheel. And each one of those components has two separate subcomponents. So capability is also um, social, uh, their uh, physical capability and psychological capability. Opportunity is their physical and social opportunity to do this. Motivation is automatic and reflective. And you'll be hearing, I think, two presentations on the theoretical domains framework. So I'm not going to say anything about that, but just to say that the, the theoretical domains framework has been linked to the COMBI model. And basically, each one of the domains sits under one of those subcomponents. And if anyone's interested, I can show you later sort of which domain sits in which component. Um, so that's the center of the behavior change wheel. And you basically, when you're thinking about designing an intervention, you sort of, what do I need to change in order to change this intervention? Do I need to improve their social um, opportunity or do I need to improve their psychological capability? And then the second level is the red level, which is the intervention function. Okay, so I've decided what do I need to change? Now, how do, what do I use in order to change that? So do I use education or do I use modeling or do I use uh, um, uh, training or coercion? And on the outer level is the policy level and sort of a higher level of whether I can use policy level interventions to affect those components. So legislation or a guideline. So it's a much higher level of, uh, of what I can do to change those subcomponents. And that's my part. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so what we did and the challenges. Um, so first of all, we integrated findings from several studies with different levels of knowledge translation. So that included a several systematic reviews of the literature, looking at both quantitative studies and also qualitative studies. We did some um, empirical research with, um, sorry, my, oh. <laughs> empirical um, research uh, with focus groups with Aboriginal women and um, surveys with health providers to find out what the evidence gaps were, what, you know, what the needs were. And um, so, and we also looked at other people's work and um, uh, that all went into the mix when we were looking at what we needed to do. Um, so up on the right there, um, you can't quite see all the text, but um, on, on one side, you've got systemic and provider approaches that we felt were needed, and on the other side, individual and community level approaches. So um, we did identify some things that were, were um, we felt um, this is a complex uh, situation, and uh, there were a lot of different factors um, and challenges needed to address Indigenous quitting during pregnancy. So, for example, the health providers we felt needed training. Um, the health messages weren't salient and not, get, not getting it across to pregnant Indigenous women. We, there was a lack of optimism in health providers. So, um, not only in the study we did, but our other people's studies, a sort of sense of what's the point trying to help um, people if they're not going to quit anyway. Um, there's no access to oral NRT on the PBS in Australia, and that's the first line medication we want to use in pregnancy. Guidelines are very inconsistent, like RSCGP guidelines say one thing and the Rennes Cogron say another thing. 
And you know, it's just not the evidence base there. So also on the, uh, you know, the other side of it, you know, we know that there is a high prevalence of smoking, that there's a lot of um, family members and partners smoking, stresses in the community, um, and women do need more community support. So um, we were building this complex intervention and we had to sort of pay a lot of attention to the cultural aspects because they're paramount in this context. And we use community-based participatory approaches to really develop this pro program, looking at um, having a, an Aboriginal advisory panel that really helped us um, work out what we needed to do. And I just uh, on going over the next bit, I, it is an iterative process which is hard to capture. So when you develop anything, I think most of you will have found it's not totally linear. There's a lot of backwards and forwards and shuffling around. But I want to show you here, um, which is the sort of uh, nugget of it, is these three stages for intervention design that are re recommended by Mickey et al. with their um, book on the behaviour change wheel. It's a very, very practical book um, with a lot of worksheets in it. We found the worksheets quite useful um, to go through. It leads you through these steps. So first of all, you do have to understand the behaviour. And we're looking at from the, both the health providers side, the, the, the services side and the women's side, but particularly um, looking on the health providers side initially, because we felt like unless the health providers are giving um, evidence-based care to women, we can't really expect them to quit. So we, we wanted to define the problem. And I, so we did sort of focus down on one main thing that we felt wasn't happening was that um, the health providers are not providing nicotine replacement therapy for women during pregnancy. You know, kind of nervous about that, lack of confidence of doing that. Um, we wanted to select that target behaviour and also then to specify it. So when we're looking at specifying the behaviour, it's like, you know, what do we want to change? Who's to change? When are they going to change? And, and all those different nuances. So, I mean, what we want really is um, the health provider to offer um, smoking cessation care to all women who smoke during pregnancy, no matter what their motivation is. So it's not the motivation they come in the room with, it's the motivation they go out the room with that we felt was important. And um, that would happen any time that that health provider sees a pregnant smoker and take those opportunities and to provide NRT early in the quit attempt um, to really be proactive about it. Um, and, and it would occur at Aboriginal medical services. So when we look at what actually needs to change, um, we needed to build up um, health providers' confidence and optimism as part of that and improve um, their capability and motivation. Um, so identifying which intervention options. Well, um, we, are, we decided to use um, education and training as our main, main approach, but there is some persuasion in there um, with messages and uh, that with the intervention functions. And then there are some policy level things with you know, service provision on the outer, outer wheel. And then looking at um, specific drilling down specific components on behavior change techniques. So we use the um, behavior change taxonomy from Susan Mickey and identified which <coughs> techniques we thought might be useful in that and um, picked out different things for different um, part of um, part of the um, intervention. So, for example, um, to build optimism. It's not a lot of literature on how do you make people feel more optimistic about doing stuff. But um, for the health providers, we wanted to emphasize, you know, the number needed to treat um, in pregnancy with smoking is, is actually quite good. You know, you need to treat 16 or 17 women to get one to quit. So that's actually a lot better in a way, for example, we compare it to if you have to um, prevent a neural tube defect by giving folic acid, you have to, you know, give hundreds and hundreds of prescriptions, you know, and, and yet people don't feel a lack of optimism about that. So we wanted to show people some good news stories with video and um, and we decided to do all of this through interactive webinar because the reach is important to all services, getting out to services no matter how rural or remote um, through our webinar. And then, you know, looking at how we measured success, that was different depending on 
whether, um, you know, which phase of our study. So it has been a three phase study. So in our first phase, when we were developing our resources and wanting to test them, we did test them in three states and we had an expert panel. We had focus groups of women and focus groups of health providers. And we made changes to the resources that went in then to a phase two pilot study, which was mainly aimed at testing feasibility and acceptability. So we kept a very detailed implementation log. Um, so all the things that you know went good or bad or indifferent, we were logging everything so we could really analyze that at the end. And at the end of the study, we're having focus groups and surveys and really getting as much information as possible um, from on the ground, both from the health provider point of view, but from the pregnant women themselves. And then another um, layer of refining those resources and going into um, a large cluster randomized controlled trial, um, which we have renamed Sisterquit. And we will be doing that in 30 services nationally. And at the moment, we're recruiting for that trial. So if anybody knows of any Aboriginal medical services that would love to do it, please let us know. And we're going to be measuring health provider behavior change, but also do the women quit? It will be powered so that we can answer that question, whether more women quit in the, in the intervention group. And we're even going on to look at follow up the babies, like, you know, if women quit, if they're in the intervention arm and getting the, you know, full, um, uh, you know, package, um, are, are the babies more likely to quit and will they, are the babies more likely to get uh, better health outcomes and particularly looking at their respiratory outcomes. So um, that's where we are and what we're doing. And I do want to just thank our funders. Um, so we do have fund, uh, funding from the Cancer Institute New South Wales for uh, funding for a fellowship and NH and MRC and also the Global Alliance for Chronic Disease and the Ministry of Health and HCRA and there's been quite a lot of people jumping on board to help us with this project. Thanks. Uh, thanks to both Gillian and Yeah. Um, as I said, we might just hold questions till the end. So next up we've got uh, Dr. Alison Reed and uh, Melanie Lovell uh, talking about their work using uh, Paris. Hello, I'm Dr. Melanie Lovell. Um, Alison's going to speak to you about this framework. I just wanted to uh, thank our previous pre presenters. Um, the framework we used to develop all our interventions in the study was the Combi framework. And so it's a lovely um, uh, segue to our presentation. Thank you. So Eric is a 69-year-old gentleman with lung cancer. He's attending his first medical oncology appointment. Uh, he's arrived with his daughter, his adult daughter and his wife. Um, with, he's actually approached in the waiting room to complete a pain screening form. Uh, the pain screening form is explained to him how you complete it and at that point his daughter says that dad is experiencing a lot of pain. So if zero was no pain and 10 was the worst pain you can imagine, he's asked, uh, his answer is 10. The patient uh, was then asked what is his average pain in the last 24 hours if 10 is his worst pain? What is his average pain? Um, at this point, Eric starts crying and says 10 again. Um, the patient was immediately triaged to the oncology registrar and, and seen so obviously straight away. Later on in the clinic, uh, Keith presents. Keith also has lung cancer. He is a regular patient coming in and he also completes the pain screening form. When he completes it, he explains that last night was a really terrible night and that the tablets he normally takes hadn't worked. He scored his worst pain as a 9 out of 10. It had eased a bit since taking the morning tablets, but uh, when asked about his average pain in the last 24 hours, he says, well, I have this pain that's right in my chest and it goes right through to my back. It's always there and the tablets don't help. So I'd rate that about a 6 out of 10. Um, as Melanie said, my name is Alison Reid and I'm the project coordinator for the Stop Cancer Pain Trial and I'm going to be presenting today on behalf of Professor Melanie Lovell and the other lead investigators. So what I've just explained there are real life examples of adult cancer patients um, attending uh, outpatient oncology and palliative care clinics. And these are the target population of the Stop Cancer Pain Trial. 
The Stop Cancer Pain Trial is a pragmatic stepped wedge uh, cluster randomised control trial and it has the aim of evaluating the effectiveness and the cost effectiveness of a suite of strategies designed to implement the Australian Cancer Pain Management Guidelines. And obviously we want to improve pain outcomes in adult cancer patients. There are four phases of the trial, including the control phase. And this is where pain screening is introduced to the site and usual care. In this arm, we recruit 50 patients. There's a training phase whereby the interventions, which are the patient health records, the audit tool, which measures adherence to the cancer pain management guideline indicators, and QStream email education. So they're all introduced during the training phase. At the intervention phase, which commences three weeks after the training phase, um, it sees the continued use of these interventions. And at this point, we go on to also recruit 50 patients. The sustainability phase is where site-specific health professionals continue to provide de-identified audit feedback for patients who score greater than seven out of 10. Our primary outcome is to evaluate the ability of the intervention arm versus the control arm to increase the probability that patients screen as having moderate severe pain which is uh, for their worst pain, which is greater than, equal to or greater than five out of 10, will experience a clinically important improvement of 30% on a zero to 10 numerical rating scale one week later. We also have secondary outcomes, which is, and we're evaluating the ability of the intervention phase versus the control phase to improve the mean worst and mean average pain severity in patients screened from baseline to weeks one, two and four. Uh, we want to improve patient empowerment. We want to compare the mean patient quality of life, improve the experiences of unpaid carers in participating patients, and to test the cost effectiveness of the implementation package versus the control arm. So you can see the step wedge design. Um, oh, sorry, oh, sorry, I've <laughs> Sorry, I've got the wrong slide. This is the right slide now, apologies. Um, so it was during the commencement of the training and intervention phase at the second site, which is when I joined the project as the project coordinator. So one of the important aspects that the executive team taught me was to ensure fidelity between the sites. So I started looking for a nice neat checklist, which I could you know, tick off and say, Right, I've done all of that, so um, I'm going to repeat that at the next site. But um, once I got a greater understanding of uh, what the project was, I came to appreciate the complexity of implementing evidence into practice. The promoting action on research implementation in health services, or the Paris framework, <laughs> provides a multi-dimensional framework to best describe how successful implementation can be achieved. The framework captures the complexity of um, implementation projects and it conceptualises the elements involved in, in implementing change and then evaluates those elements with measures. And the framework is then able to explain or predict the likelihood of success of that implementation. The framework works well in the step wedge design because it can be used retrospectively um, to, to assess how successful it was, but um, it's been really good because we've been also able to use it prospectively with the lessons we've learnt um, for the next site. So the Paris framework uh, identifies successful research implementation as a function of the dynamic and simultaneous relationship between evidence, context and facilitation. So these three elements are further broken down into sub-elements and they contain definitions to classify them on a high-low continuum or as represented here, the strong to weak continuum. So the grid that's pictured here shows that when evidence is strong, when context is strong and there is good facilitation, this represents the ideal situation for implementation of evidence into practice. Evidence is strong when the research is well conceived, when the clinical experience is reflected upon and valued as evidence, 
when patient preferences are used as part of the decision making process and when local data is systematically collected and evaluated. The context is rated as high when the organisation has a learning culture. Leaders within that organisation are transformational and they inspire staff to share a vision, therefore creating effective teamwork and the team members have really clear roles of what their um, part is to play. The context is also ranked highly when there's a really good feedback process and that, that is developed and is able to report back to the people how effective their change is being. The third element that we uh, mentioned there is facilitation and that refers to the process of enabling or just making easier the implementation of evidence into practice. The framework suggests that good facilitation incorporates a holistic process that allows for reflection and analysis of attitudes and behaviours to change in the workplace. And it also recognises that a good facilitator is one that has the skills and attributes to support practitioners to change their practice. Sorry. Um, so there are challenges to implementing this framework. Um, firstly, it does require qualitative exploration of the data and then a judgment is made on where it sort of fits in the sub-element um, on that high-low or strong weak continuum. The judgment is, is obviously then can be subjective and it can be also difficult to provide detail about how you came to the conclusion that it, where, where it fits on that continuum. A 2010 systematic review of the Paris framework identified that the framework has mainly been used retrospectively through our own literature review, um, we have found that there have been some later studies where they have used it prospectively, but in the main, it has been used retrospectively, and this is how we've used the framework to date in early site involvement. This indicates a sort of rather an evaluation of the data rather than allowing the framework to um, design the implementation process. The lineal nature of the continuum does not always work for the qualitative data analysis. Um, we are doing this in outpatient oncology and palliative care units and anyone who's been to one of those places can understand the dynamics of the workplace the, um, and again that complexity. And often we found when we were trying to rank in the sub-elements that we had some aspects which we could rank high and low but within the same sub-elements. So that was also, so that linear nature is quite difficult. Um, and finally, the definitions contained within the sub-elements are not pres prescriptive, which is good in one way, but also it means that they can be open to interpretation. And this can make it difficult to map the definition to the individual results. So how successful has the Paris framework been for um, this particular project? Well, what I'm just showing you on this slide is how we went about um, utilising the framework for early site involvement and we basically built a table that documented the sub-elements with the definition um, embedded in that sub-element and then we linked uh, our qualitative data to that, that definition and then came up with the rank there. Um, the, in, so it has been good for us in the sense that it has enabled us to identify and address barriers. It's allowed us to harness local facilitators to help optimise the delivery of the intervention at each trial site. It's allowed us to share the lessons learned from each site through the development of community of practice meeting. Um, we've been able to shape negotiations with the future trial sites around expectations and finally it's really sharpened our processes in how to um, go about implementing the project. So we would therefore conclude that the Paris framework has been successful in the sense that it is fit for the purpose that we had intended and that was to provide an evaluation of the success of the implementation at each site. But before finishing I just It'd be remiss of me not to tell you about um, Eric and Keith again. Um, just to let you know that both Eric and Keith did have their pain assessed as per the Australian Cancer Pain Management Guidelines and appropriate management was initiated. 
with Eric being admitted for pain control and Keith being given a pain management plan and education about controlling his pain. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alison. Um, another great presentation right on time, so it's wonderful. Um, next up, I'd just like to welcome uh, Natalie Taylor, who is uh, going to be talking about her work uh, incorporating theoretical domains. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Um, Okay, so I'm going to talk to you today about the theoretical domains framework implementation approach in the context of hereditary cancer. And um, so a bit of background about the research project. Um, so we were working uh, to try to improve some clinical practice in the area of Lynch syndrome. Um, so Lynch syndrome is a hereditary condition and it increases the risk of cancers, particularly bowel cancer. It's present um, in 50% of first degree relatives um, and identification allows surveillance or early detection. And this has the potential then to prevent cancer for patients and their families. The guidelines recommend that um, tumour screening should occur with follow-up by hereditary cancer services with those patients who are at high risk of uh, carrying the Lynch syndrome gene. Approximately one in 250 people carry the gene, but it's um, very underdiagnosed. Um, in New South Wales alone, over 17,000 people remain undiagnosed um, who carry this gene. So we um, concluded that the translation of the latest genomic evidence into practice was lacking. And the project aim was to improve the identification of colorectal cancer patients with a high likelihood risk of Lynch syndrome using behavior change theory and implementation science. So which framework and why? Um, so we decided to use the theoretical domains framework implementation approach. So why not just the, the theoretical domains framework? Um, so I thought I'd give you a little bit of background about the, the use of the TDF that I've had in the past. Um, so I started using the framework, um, I think it was in 2007. So it was only two years old at the time. And this was around um, uh, promoting physical activity in university staff and students. So I used the TDF to understand what the barriers to participation were and then designed interventions using mapped behaviour change techniques to each domain to um, try to promote physical activity for the most prominent barriers for uh, people um, who wanted to increase their physical activity. Then um, as, we, as I moved on um, into a postdoc, um, this kind of introduced me to the clinical space and I had to um, use the TDF um, to implement guidelines um, for improving patient safety. And um, in doing this, um, at the time, I noticed that there wasn't any uh, tools available for implementing or using the TDF um, as a framework in clinical practice. Um, so I, I thought that there were, there were things missing and, and ways in which it could be improved. Um, includes principles of co-design of interventions, um, monitoring and um, practice over time. Um, um, uh, what else does it include? Um, <laughs> seven other things. Um, so kind of understanding the context in which you're um, implementing your interventions into um, and uh, produce kind of use of boundary spanners across the system to try and make sure that messages are um, translating to and from the sharp end up to the, the, the top aspects of the, of the organisation. Um, this, uh, this kind of development of this approach using the TDF um, led to a suite of resources being developed, including a one day training um, session and um, a, a kind of training package which uh, people tasked with implementation in their own organisation can, can use and take away so that they can use the TDFI approach in their own context for their own particular um, implementation project. And we also demonstrated that um, we, we the, the cost effectiveness of this approach um, for implementing guidelines, in particular around um, reducing the harm caused th uh, through feeding uh, by feeding through 
uh, misplaced nasogastric tubes. So what is the TDFI? Um, so it's a six step process which incorporates these 10 implementation principles and also um, incorporates the, um, the theoretical domains framework. So the first aspect is to involve stakeholders. So this might be uh, medical directors and the sharp end staff who um, are relevant to the problem that you're trying to solve. Uh, the second part is to identify the target behaviour through audit and discussion and process mapping. Um, then it's um, around trying to identify barriers. So we use um, the influences on patient safety behaviours questionnaire, which consists of the domains of the TBF um, to, um, kind of linked to it, uh, it, uh, the particular problem that you're attempting to solve. Um, and um, this kind of me measures the key barriers from a quantitative perspective amongst the people who are within the target group that you're attempting to change. Um, we then go on to um, confirm barriers through focus groups with relevant uh, staff um, and generate intervention strategies using um, behaviour change techniques um, which we introduce to staff in terms of which might be most appropriate for addressing the key barriers um, and th then we ask if they can come up with ideas um, facilitated <coughs> by our team to um, generate um, and co-design interventions that we then can go on to implement um, as a joint approach with the staff and then eventually evaluate the intervention through reauditing. So we, we use this approach to um, try to improve uh, referral behaviours for patients with colorectal cancer who may be at high risk of Lynch syndrome in two hospitals um, in New South Wales. So there were some challenges implementing the framework um, and these are kind of interrelated theory and practical based challenge, uh, uh, aspects that affect affected implementation. So the first thing uh, that came to mind was the accessibility of the theory. So in this particular approach, and I think uh, an approach that's necessary for getting engagement um, from uh, stakeholders with theory, um, you, the theory, whilst the TDF was, was kind of designed to be accessible to non-health psychologists, I still feel that it is quite a difficult um, concept for people to grasp uh, particularly if you're thinking in the context of a focus group where you're asking people to use behaviour change strategies uh, that they may never have been introduced to before um, and then try to operationalise those into interventions that are meaningful within their own context. We really tried to facilitate that process but I still think that it was quite a difficult thing for um, non-experts in this particular field to, um, to try to achieve. Um, and so this brings me on to compliance with the theory. Um, in the health system, people, um, it, I mean, it, it moves so fast and people are really um, uh, quick to try to fix a problem once it's presented in front of them and they can see the gaps in their own practice. So even though our six steps are all nicely lined up and there's going to be some focus groups and we're going to use some behaviour change techniques to fix a problem, and by the time you've organised those and people are aware of the problem, they want to go straight in and start to fix it with the, you know, their intuition and the tacit knowledge that they have from the, the organisation that they're working in. And, and even though I think that's a really good thing in one perspective, um, it, it doesn't really mean that we've complied with the theory. And, and that kind of brings me on to then if you're trying to test the theory and how effective it is in, in eliciting changes in behaviour, you've got a really difficult task in trying to unpick where um, the, the interventions have been driven by theory and where they've actually been developed intuitively. And um, you know, how, how do you how do you really um, establish what um, how effective the, the theory was in this whole process? Um, I think in all to overcome some of those issues, um, just keeping a, a really clear audit trail of, of exactly what's happened along the way and, and try to establish which interventions have been developed through an intuitive process versus through a theory driven process is one way of at least trying to understand what's happened, even if um, it doesn't help you to measure exactly um, any causal inferences of, of what's happened through the process. 
On the practical side, um, navigating the system um, as, a, as a researcher from the outside, I think is quite a difficult thing to do and affects implementation in a real big way. Um, it's, you know, silly things like getting epic sign off, um, being able to nip into an MDT meeting and see what's happening happening um, which all contributes to the bigger picture of what the problem might be and, and how realistic some of the interventions that you're trying to design could be um, when you, you know proposing them in the system um, and system changes um, with our particular project occurred so there was a huge movement with both hospitals to a new ele electronic patient management system and also in one of the hospitals, um, the, the, the whole cancer services moved to a new building. So people had other priorities than our you know, small project to improve referrals for um, patients with a hereditary cancer gene. Um, and the problem complexity as well. So when, I, even though I, I, um, I had uh, worked with all of the other chief investigators on the proposal to really understand the problem and design the, design the project the, the way that I thought that it would be able to solve the problem that they were telling me occurred. The, the development of the proposal only really scratched the surface. We didn't um, really fully understand the complexity of it and as a result um, it meant that there was a lot of staff groups that faced different barriers to different parts of the process and therefore measuring those in a different way according to a different target behavior for change um, and, and, and then designing interventions specifically aligned to those different target behaviors for the different groups um, would have probably been a better way to do it. Um, so evaluating framework performance, um, I asked myself a few questions um, about whether or not the TDFI was successful for engaging stakeholders. So we had 16 medical professionals, two consumers, um, and we had senior approval for interventions based on a report um, that we'd uh, generated for um, the, you know, the, the senior staff within the organisation so that the in intervention implementation was um, signed off and, and people were confident to move forward. Um, choosing the right target behaviour, so we had uh, detailed process maps cross-matched with practice audit data identifying major gaps in practice um, but after digging a bit further um, what I would have probably said is that we'd have started further upstream because I think there was um, issues um, prior to the actual making the referral behaviour that needed to be addressed before that could actually be improved. Um, identifying key barriers, um, so 37 people um, completed our questionnaires and we had focus groups involving 19 healthcare professionals. Um, we had 16 interventions de designed using the theory di driven approach and we had a, an audit trail showing intuitive intervention development. 11 interventions were implemented and as I mentioned we had significant delays. Achieving practice change, um, we um, in pathology, we um, improved the process so that um, from the beginning there was 0% of uh, BRAF testing occurring, which is the secondary test which helps uh, to um, further clarify the high risk nature of the Lynch syndrome patients and that went up to 100% in both hospitals by the end. But referrals um, didn't significantly change, so uh, they went up by 10% in hospital A but only uh, but went down by 4% in hospital B. Um, it, and there is a possibility that some deferred referrals um, were picked up at our last measurement point. And have we improved understanding for cancer genomics evidence translation? I think yes. Um, we are assessing the acceptability, appropriateness, feasibility, adoption and cost of the TDFI um, for um, this particular area. And we demonstrated so much learning halfway through that we won an award. Um, so, what next? Um, so, we've got some funding to um, do this, expand this work and make improvements for three years across three states, the postdoc and two PhD scholarships. We're going to be testing the TDFI approach versus in implementation science principles alone to see if all of this theory really is worth it. And um, we're going to be looking at the cost effectiveness of these approaches through some um, economic models that track the um, natural history of um, Lynch syndrome patients.
Thanks so much, Natalie. Some great work being presented so far. Um, we're now going to hear from uh, Professor Jane Phillips. So he's going to be talking about the pre seed process. Great, thank you very much for this invitation. I presume I just go page down. Is that right? Uh, press the arrow. Press the arrow, of course. Okay, thank you. So thanks for the opportunity to present. Um, I'm, I love frameworks, I love models, I love having a conceptual idea to hang something from. And this is probably one of um, a model that's probably quite near and dear to my heart. And I'm going to sort of in the next um, few minutes unpack why. But first of all, I want you to imagine, I want you to imagine that you're passionate about your health area, that you're actually in a community and you actually have an opportunity to make a difference. You actually have funding, you have a mission and you have a mandate. But with that comes enormous responsibility. And probably over a decade ago, that's where I found myself in a rural regional community um, in New South Wales. And that's what I'm going to talk about. It's some um, lessons from the Rural Palliative Care Project. So basically I'd worked with a group of GPs. Um, I was working as a clinical nurse consultant in um, Cross Harbour. And we had um, secured quite a significant amount of money. And it was actually to really start looking differently about how we could strengthen rural palliative care partnerships. Um, you know, the Cox is a beautiful, it's, it's where the mountains meet the sea. It's really where many people go for their holidays and at the end of um, their working careers, they end up retiring. So in actual fact, it had at the time and continues to have one of the most rapidly growing ageing populations in Australia. And it's estimated that probably, you know, over a third of the population by 20. 31 will actually be aged over 65. And what we know with increasing age comes the increasing need for palliative care services. But as a clinical nurse consultant, I never, ever, ever went into aged care. And it was a complete mystery what actually happened in aged care. Um, so what this project really illuminated was that we were wanting to look at populations in our community who had unmet palliative care needs. We had some commission research, but we had an, an opportunity to do more work. And it really became very apparent very early that in actual fact, there was this potential untapped need um, for older people admitted to residential aged care facilities. But we need to, to really think about how we were actually going to manage um, all of this um, information, but also decide on what sort of intervention would be most appropriate. And having had some experience using Pre-Seed Proceed, having had a health promotion background and working in HIV in the early days, that it seemed really quite appropriate to apply this model. And the reason I really want to apply it was that I knew to make a good decision that we would need to synthesise and gather a lot of data. Um, we also needed to think about the link between the priority health problems of the community and the community's needs. But also too, I needed a framework that would enable me to plan effectively to, even though we didn't use the words co-design, in effect it was around co-design, and to also develop an intervention that was really appropriate um, for the needs that would make a difference, but was actually very targeted. But we also needed to evaluate it and proceeds seem to tick all of those boxes and I'll explain to you why. So what you see on the screen is really a stylized version of Proceed Proceed. And I might go to the next slide first of all. So basically, and many of you I know in the room will be familiar with it. It's a framework that um, has been around, oh sorry, I've just sent a time code, isn't it? Almost away. <laughs> My apologies. Um, perhaps I'll move back. It's too, too, too awkward to look at. <laughs> this is what happens when you do slides at four o'clock in the morning. Um, basically, it's a, forgive my spelling, um, type in. It's a program, it's a framework that was actually being developed and widely um, used. It was developed in the 1980s. And I guess it is actually an interesting framework because you actually start um, from the right hand side at phase one and you move across the top through the pre-seed which is the planning phase then you do the administration or the implementation and then at the bottom proceed is the evaluation framework and if you've done it right and you've set up your 
objectives and your outcomes um, and um, your measures, when you're planning, then in actual fact, you're actually totally able to evaluate what you've done. But I'll come up to this stylized version, which I hope hasn't got too many errors in. So you see the start in the right hand. So basically you need to start to think about what, what can be achieved and what needs to be achieved, um, changed to achieve it. And that really, the other thing about pre-seed, proceed, it really forces you, and particularly as a nurse, it's a good thing to do to think outside of just the patient, really forces you to think about what's the end deliverable that you really, the aspirational goal that you're really wanting to achieve, but also to think about some of the um, social determinants of health. So really things around health status, quality of life, um, socioeconomic um, status, um, behavioural aspects, environmental um, components, because they're actually really quite critical. And I think often as health professionals, we say an implementation, implementation fail, particularly when it's involving patients, because they just didn't do what we told them to do. But in actual fact, we haven't actually really considered about the context in which they live and need, need to function. And this is actually what pre-seed, proceed actually forces um, you to do. So once you've actually worked through that, so for us in terms of the epidemiological um, stages, which is stages um, one and two, it actually became really apparent that there was a significant burden of death that was actually occurring in residential aged care facilities and that these people did not actually have access to specialist palliative care and they had um, questionable quality in terms of palliative care delivery. But it's not my place as an outsider to come in and actually tell residential aged care or GPs what to do being a specialist palliative care nurse. And that's actually where it becomes really important in terms of working with all of the stakeholders. And pre-seed in many respects enables you to do that. Because what happens during each one of those um, phases is as part of the design is that you really get an opportunity to engage um, in co-designing and getting people to think about what are all the the items, and I'll, I'll speak mostly to the predisposing, re enabling and reinforcing factors. And what it really enables you to do is not only to draw on the existing evidence and the audit data that you might have um, in really suggesting that there's need for change, but you actually start to engage, be that um, patients, residents and families, um, aged care staff, care assistants who provide the bulk of the work, GPs, um, directors of nursing, specialist um, palliative care services, and you really start to get them to brainstorm about each one of those factors. So what predisposes um, in aged care for people to have access to palliative care? What are the enabling factors um, that enable people to actually get the services they need? But what's actually really reinforcing it? As part of this process, what you get to do is that you actually need to be able to rank them. And there are two really important components that um, are integral to the precinct proceed. And that is that you need to be able to identify how changeable is the element that you've been identifying? How changeable, what, what's your assumption that you'll be able to make a difference? And you actually get to rank that in terms of how important, um, ranking from high to low. And you also do that for importance because things might actually be really changeable, but at the end of the day, they may not be much that important. And one of the things that um, at the end of that process, what you then do, and it's very subjective, and I my preference is to actually do it as part of the co-design process, that you actually get the group to facilitate, to work out, just totally brainstorm all the predisposing, reinforcing, enabling factors, and then get them to actually rank it. Because what you actually will find is that some things will clearly fall out as being very important and actually very changeable. And I think sometimes in health, we actually need to be a little bit more pragmatic. We may have aspirational goals about, you know, ensuring that we've got electronic health records, that everybody gets um, 
assess for symptoms as soon as they walk into a clinic. But we need to think about, you know, how changeable at this point in time is that with the resources that we have in terms of the political environment um, and the willingness of stakeholders to engage in it. The other reason I like to do co um, contribute, have um, collaborators contributing to this process is that once you've actually ranked it, you come to some agreement about where you think you should be targeting your energy because it starts to become really quite obvious. That is not to say that the other items aren't really um, important and that you shouldn't come back to in the next round of funding or the next iteration in doing. And this quadrant here actually shows, demonstrates that the evidence suggests, not surprisingly, that you're most likely to be able to affect change if uh, items are considered to be both important and changeable. And that's where we need to sort of focus our energy on um, developing the intervention. So once you've actually identified that, you can actually start to set up um, the program. So for instance, in the work that I was involved in, was it really became apparent that we needed to have strategies that not only addressed um, residents and their families' needs, and there was a whole component about that. We actually also needed to think about the role of the GP in coming into aged care and the, and the way in which registered nurses access medical care. We actually really needed to think about the capabilities of the nursing um, workforce, particularly because it's a very variable workforce where the majority of care is provided by unskilled workers. And we also needed to think about their engagement. We needed to think about the way in which the facilities spoke to families about that they about palliative care, because pretty much even though death is omnipresent in residential aged care, it's actually very, um, it's quite hidden and it's not um, an overt thing. So emerging, emerging from that was a decision to actually focus initially, which often happens in health interventions, on actually really building capacity. Because at this point in time, very little investment had been made in terms of increasing care assistance, um, registered nurses and GPs capabilities about delivering uh, <coughs> care. And the intervention that we device was actually had to take into consideration all of those items that you actually see, the policies, the resources, the organisation, service and program components. Because we were doing it as part of a large uh, project, we were indeed fortunate that we had funding. So we had a mission, a mandate and money. The three M's, the things that you often need to bring people to the table. There are also evidence-based guidelines that had just been released about how they what was in considered best practice in terms of providing end of life care to older people. So all of those factors really provided an important driving um, component. So what we were able to do, we were able to buy out GPs times um, to enable them to do a placement with the specialist palliative care team. We established a multidisciplinary team whereby aged care providers and uh, GPs could actually phone in. We also had link, established link nurses, clinical champions, and we actually built, significantly built the capabilities of the in-house um, care assistant team. And at the end of that, we were actually able to evaluate each one of those components because we had um, very clear evaluation guidelines around implementation the processes, but also to the impact of the family and all of that work has actually been published. So I think probably I've covered most of it, but it's really, it's a great framework for helping you to identify what you actually want to achieve in terms of both um, process outcomes, impact outcomes, and, and also the ultimate um, outcome. It enables you to develop the intervention. I've spoken about that. And I think it just really reminds us that health, we really need to remember that health related behaviours and activities that individuals engage in are almost, almost always voluntary. And any health intervention has to involve those whose behaviours we we're actually wanting to change. And I think it's really important to actually think about the community and the context in which it 
um, lives. And um, if you would like to read more, we've actually published this work and it takes you through a step by step of what we actually did within two projects. The other one is a cardiovascular project where we've actually pro um, provided the Pre-Seed Proceed framework. And perhaps just in closing, it Pre-Seed Proceed is not just the only framework you can use. We've actually heard some fabulous presentations this morning outlining a number of different frameworks. And to be honest, if I was to do this work again, um, I probably would be using the behaviour change wheel once I'd actually got the predisposing, reinforcing, enabling factors, because in actual fact, it would probably help guide the and strengthen the intervention development. So thank you. Thanks a lot, Jane. Uh, next up, we've got some another presentation of the pre seed pro seed model in a different context. It'll be interesting to see how they uh, compare it across. So, welcome, Mia Brown. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, so we can. Okay, thank you. So, um, yes, yeah, so I am actually from Sydney Catalyst, but this is work that was conducted when I was at the Sachs Institute, so I should acknowledge that. Um, so the CLICK study was a step wedge cluster randomised implementation trial. Um, it was an NHMRC partnership project involving the Sachs Institute, um, the New South Wales Agency for Clinical Innovation, um, the Cancer Council New South Wales, University of Sydney, and it was co-funded by the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia. Um, it was a trial that involved um, 40 clinicians from nine MDTs across um, eight local health districts, and we actually ended up collecting data on just over a thousand eligible patients of those double that were actually screened for eligibility. Um, so to give you some context, um, there's an Australia Cancer Network clinical practice guideline um, that states that um, post-radical prostatectomy is the primary curative treatment for prostate cancer. Um, men who have high risk pathological features should be referred for consideration of adjuvant radiotherapy. And all that data from Australia and the US and Canada and other regions shows that approximately 10 to 20% of those men actually receive that therapy. So the aim of the study was to increase the guideline recommended referral of these men um, for consideration of adjuvant radiotherapy. So the primary outcome was actually referral and we had a number of secondary outcomes which I'll come to later, but it wasn't actually the receipt of radiotherapy, it was actually the referral because men just weren't actually being given the option to have the conversation, even it just, they had no idea that they had the option. So we used the pre-seed proceed model. I think Jane did a good job of selling that to you, so I won't, <laughs> I won't go into it too much detail, but one of the reasons we used it is, as Jane said, it really enables you to actually plan the intervention as well as the evaluation. Um, and as Jane said, it moves backwards from your desired outcome all the way through um, to the four formative phases of pre-seed, move backwards to where and how you might intervene, and then you go to implementation phase, and then you move forwards again towards your evaluation. So in terms of the context of CLIC, um, phase one had already been determined. So there had been an Australian national strategy published that said we needed to improve prostate cancer services for men with prostate cancer, thereby improving their outcomes and health related quality of life. It had already been said as a social need. And there was evidence from three randomized controlled trials that showed that you could increase this outcome, outcomes and survival um, by increasing referral to radiotherapy. So we basically stepped in at phases three and four, um, educational and ecological assessment and then the policy and administrative assessment. So to look at what would be the predisposing, reinforcing and enabling factors and then mapping intervention elements to those factors um, to see how we could actually bring about the behaviour change. To do that, we conducted a multi-stage needs and barriers analysis. Um, and I think this is where the engagement of the people you're actually trying to um, get to change was really important. By the time we've done this, we had spoken with pretty much every urologist that we wanted to change behaviour. Uh, we consulted broadly with a wide range of people through um, workshops, a survey of every single urologist in Australia. We got about 60% of them actually responded to that survey, but it's not bad for a clinician survey. Um, we had consumer feedback as to what patients actually wanted in terms of information from their clinicians. And then looking at the, the sort of more context specific elements, we um, in phase four with the administrative and policy assessment, we actually spoke with representatives of all of the clinical sites to see what the local context specific barriers were, and then to look at how we would actually develop intervention components that would solve those issues. So that was done in consultation with the local sites, and it was done in consultation with the Cancer Care Action Advisory Group, which had representatives from pretty much every cancer policy agency and very much um, 
prostate, urology, radiology specific um, representatives as well. So from all of that information, we came up with this. So essentially what we found is that there were a lot of um, individual level barriers. When we first started speaking to people, they kept saying it was systems level barriers. And actually when we did the phase four um, administrative assessment, we found that those barriers actually weren't barriers at all. They were being used as excuses to mask the fact that it was individual decisions that were actually stopping, stopping the behavior that we wanted. Um, and in terms of the theory and something that Liz said earlier about, you know, if you have gaps in your theory, you know, you can meld some together. Um, in terms of the clinician barriers and the elements, we actually, those knowledge, attitudes, perceptions and norms actually come from the theory of planned behaviour. Because ultimately it was the individual behaviours and the decision to change behaviour that was going to be how we would actually get any kind of change in our outcome. So we identified a range of barriers at the patient level, clinician level, hospital level, um, and then the wider health system context, which the patient and the health system were outside of the scope of what we actually were going to, what we were actually tackling. Um, but in terms of the, um, the clinician level barriers, they were really kind of, there wasn't so much of a gap in knowledge around the evidence, but they didn't necessarily have a full understanding of what radiotherapy techniques were. So they kept throwing up issues with side effects and toxicity, but it was actually because they didn't really have a good understanding of, of what the real side effects and toxicities of radio, current radiotherapy techniques were. Um, they had very, very negative attitudes towards the evidence, even though there were three large randomised controlled trials supporting the, the, the um, clinical practice guideline. And like I say, they had issues with... Um, sort of side effects and toxicity. And there was an issue that there was an ongoing clinical trial actually being conducted by one of our chief investigators, not very helpfully, that was trying to actually directly compare adjuvant radiotherapy with salvage radiotherapy. So essentially, do patients really benefit from therapy before they've got any signs of cancer being, being still being current? Or do you wait until they show signs of recurrence and give them salvage radiotherapy? But yeah, thank you for that, Andrew. Um, at the hospital level, there was really variable engagement with the MDT. So we had a situation where some clinicians never went to the MDT. It, it was on a time when they had their consulting. They maybe sent their registrar, maybe didn't. Um, and that they were very selective in the cases they presented to the MDT as well. So very few patients were being put forward. At the start of the study, only 17% of patients were being discussed at the MDT, and 17% of high-risk patients were being discussed at the MDT. That was very low. Um, so we developed a range of physician-focused and context-focused components. So, um, and these are then linked to the predisposing, reinforcing, and enabling factors. So the predisposing factors were around um, clinician education. Um, so we had, we kind of developed a video that was put forward, um, which actually has our opinion leaders in there as well. So it was a kind of a combination of predisposing, reinforcing, which summarised the evidence, but it was also kind of like, you know, slowly, slowly from the, the top down, kind of encouraging people to adopt the behaviours that we wanted them to do. We had printed materials. Um, like I say, we had opinion leaders. Those were at the sort of national level. So we had the... Um, President of USANS, which is the Urological Society of Australia and New Zealand, so like their peak sort of body. Um, we had a kind of more local clinical leader for each site, and then we also had the clinical chair of the Agency for Clinical Innovation Urology Clinical Network as well. So we had three levels of clinical leaders that were involved. And then enabling factors, we actually introduced a new system where patients were directly flagged to the MDT coordinator through pathology. So once um, surgical specialists had gone to pathology, if there was adverse pathology, the pathology service would notify the MDT coordinator that this patient was high risk and they were automatically put on the MDT list for discussion. So it took away that sort of discretionary process where it was really just left up to the clinician whether or not they would actually present those cases. So like I say, we didn't include any patient level factors or health system factors. And the idea being that these predisposing, reinforcing and enabling factors would actually increase the frail to radiation oncology. And then that would actually lead to the, the desired outcome of um, increased quality of life. So the intervention was rolled out over a 16 month period in over 10, 10 steps using our step wedge design. So obviously the sites were randomized to the order at which they got the intervention. So Later sites didn't get as many rounds of audit and feedback as the earlier sites. Um, and then we had a um, mixed methods process evaluation, which included um, quantitative measures of the intervention elements. So 
implementation, participation, response, and context. So implementation was um, considered in terms of um, the extent to which it was implemented as planned with fidelity, the degree, the, the degree to which the essential elements were actually delivered, um, the level of exposure, so in terms of the timing, the, the length of exposure, and then local adaptation of the processes. Response was considered the extent to which the MDTs actually integrated and adopted those new systems and approaches. And then context, we actually documented all the local level contextual issues that actually may have um, positively or negatively impacted um, the implementation. So what we found through interviews with the participants was that the enabling factors were actually considered the most influential. Influential, maybe it was just that they were easiest because they didn't actually have to do anything, um, but they considered that, that was like the most significant and beneficial change to them. This MDT flagging process that actually just was a new system that went on in the background um, and actually enabled them to change their behaviour. Um, the reinforcing factors of audit and feedback were considered influential. Interestingly, not necessarily in terms of the behaviour we were looking at, but in terms of being very competitive with each other about their surgical outcomes, not end outcomes of patients. So it was more like, you know, who has adverse events more than others. Um, the, the provider education, so the pre factors and the reinforcing factors were really mixed responses. But I think what it speaks to is that when you have a multidisciplinary intervention, not, you know, not everybody responds to each element in the same way. So actually, you need all of those factors because different people respond to them differently, much as you know, when you're teaching people respond to different te te teaching techniques in different ways. Um, so ultimately, I think really enabling factors were, were the most significantly influential factors. And then we actually, in terms of the impact and outcome evaluation, impact was assessed through um, pre and post intervention surveys, which measured knowledge and attitudinal um, beliefs and we actually found that there, there was no significant change in the sort of attitudes and beliefs of our clinicians like the, the kind of educational and so the, the predisposing and reinforcing factors hadn't actually really made much of a difference to their overall attitudes and beliefs so those individual level barriers actually still persisted. Um, I think one of the, the reasons for that may have actually been that the audit and feedback, particularly early rounds of audit and feedback, provided feedback more on the MDT flagging process rather than the referral, because referral was ultimately delayed and we couldn't assess that until six months after, after treatment. So they got very caught up on how well they were doing in terms of their MDT discussion, but not necessarily on how they were actually changing the behaviour we really wanted. Um, and then we did assess outcomes through um, primary and secondary outcomes outcomes through independent medical record review and so secondary outcomes we had significant increase primary outcome we actually didn't see any significant change at all so mixed bag it was successful in some ways and not in others but I think in terms of the theory it was very useful in terms of mapping out the whole process from identifying needs mapping the intervention and then the, the whole process impact and outcome evaluation Experience. I think that project uh, really demonstrates how complex um, implementation can be and how useful theory can be in that respect. So our uh, final speaker is um, Megan Finch, who's going to be talking again about uh, the theoretical dynamics. Thanks everybody. So I'm going to take us all back to the TDF and I'm going to take us to the community setting, in particular the childcare setting. Am I too short? <laughs> okay, so before I start though, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting today and pay my respects to elders past, present and future. I'd also like to acknowledge my colleagues and collaborators on this work from the University of Newcastle and Country New England Population Health. Um, so this case study that I'm going to be talking to today describes the application of the theoretical domains framework um, in the development and design of a uh, multi-component intervention um, in the childcare setting aiming to improve the implementation of dietary menu guidelines. So I'm just going to start to give a bit of background to contextualise the work and um, then I'll move on to describing uh, the theoretical domains framework and discuss how we applied it in the intervention. 
uh, development and then talk to um, uh, the evaluation, how we measured out um, the success of the intervention and then finalise by discussing some of the challenges that we encountered along the way. Okay. <laughs> Oh, can I just tap that? Can I you just use the tap that? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so to start off with, um, so a number of government and public health organisations, I guess internationally and within Australia and within states, have identified childcare as a key setting in which to intervene and develop interventions or programs to address young children's nutrition behaviours. Um, and one key policy response to this has been the development of setting specific dietary guidelines that broadly recommend that these settings provide food that are in line with population dietary <coughs> guidelines. Now in New South Wales, these are outlined in the Caring for Children resource, um, which broadly um, recommends that childcare services provide foods to children while they're in care, um, or 50% of their dietary recommendations. They specifically, um, I guess, outline uh, the types and quantities of foods provided, and that is, half of the recommended number of serves that are outlined in the Australian Dietary Guidelines. So they also have, I guess, uh, seen as the best practice guidelines on um, menu planning for the early childhood education and care setting, and they're targeted at cooks and service managers. Now, um, despite these guidelines being in existence, um, from studies that we've conducted both in the Hunt New England, where we have uh, reviewed um, childcare service menus and also from samples conducted across New South Wales. Um, there's evidence that um, these guidelines are almost universally not being um, met and that the specific recommendations for food groups that should be provided in care um, are not, um, that services just aren't compliant with them. And I guess this is um, quite interesting despite the fact that these guidelines, particularly in New South Wales, have been around for about 20 years in one form or another. You can see the yellow up there. Um, they have incredibly high recognition among childcare service cooks and service managers and they exist in the context of quite supportive licensing and accreditation standards. Um, and I guess so to us um, this suggests that there's considerable practice impediments to uh, these guidelines implementation out there in the childcare setting. Okay so I guess in this context um, uh, that it was in this context that we decided to approach this implementation uh, problem, guideline implementation problem, by applying the theoretical Berkeley's framework um, to try and address um, and improve um, menu guideline compliance. So the theoretical uh, domains framework um, is a determinant uh, framework. It was developed by behavioural uh, scientists and implementation researchers broadly as a means to allow the use of behavioural theory um, in, in understanding and addressing implementation problems. So we all know here um, that there are a number of uh, different uh, theories out, or frameworks out there that we could draw on and I guess to talk to why we actually chose uh, the TDF. So, from our perspective, it's one of the most comprehensive frameworks. So um, it's been constructed um, from um, 33, or oh, 108 constructs from 33 behaviour change uh, theories that are relevant to implementation have been grouped together in 14 domains that cover kind of like the key factors that are known to influence um, or be barriers and enablers to implementation behaviours. So secondly, I guess the other key thing is it actually provides quite a systematic approach um, that researchers and practitioners can follow uh, in firstly understanding uh, implementation, the determinants of both the current uh, practice and desired um, implementation behaviours or practices. And then it also identifies the areas, specific areas um, to act on to change these and um, provides steps to select um, recommended strategies to address these. Um, it's also been successfully applied in the design of complex implementation interventions in clinical settings that have been effective in modifying care delivery practices. And finally, it's one of the uh, few um, frameworks that have psychometrically evaluated measures that you can use to assess um, constructs. Okay, so here is uh, the TDF. So, um, Sorry about the busyness of this slide, but I just um, basically wanted to include this so that you can see the 14 domains and get a sense of the um, example meaning as it relates to the implementation behaviours around guideline implementation. Um, so you can see the full set of domains there, except one's dropped off the bottom. Um, I think that's, I don't know what that is. Um, 
and you can get a sense of the scope of each of, I guess, the, the domain. So for example, for knowledge um, in relation to the work that we're doing, we're looking at whether the key people know know about the guidelines for starters, are they aware, do they understand their rationale, um, do they have the appropriate procedural knowledge um, around the guidelines. Um, in terms of uh, the domain of social influences, looking at who might be influential um, in making the decision to implement the guidelines out and set the childcare setting. Um, looking at the domain of beliefs about capabilities, whether staff are confident in their capacity to implement the guidelines and what are factors that might make it easy or harder for them to do this. Okay, um, so the first step that we took in, I guess, applying uh, the TDF in the development of our, of our intervention was to actually identify um, the barriers and enablers um, to uh, the implementation of um, menu, dietary menu guidelines. So we did this um, by firstly looking at the literature, obviously any relevant published papers or otherwise that are identifying specific barriers or enablers. We then, I guess, supplemented this with um, Survey surveys and semi-structured interviews uh, with service managers and cooks um, that we're using, I guess, modified versions of the TDF, and then conducting on-site observations of the uh, food service and menu planning practices um, out in childcare services. So this allowed us to, um, I guess, collect both quantitative and qualitative data um, on the barriers and enablers, and also to get a sense of their relative importance and then to get that um, key, I guess, contextual information about the environment in which service cooks um, work and plan menus. And you can see that um, a number of um, barriers and enablers were identified. There's some examples up there, and they, um, this slide, I guess, also shows how they were then mapped to each of the domains. So this next slide, another busy one, um, in the um, it's talking through how we then used um, the domains um, that were identified for each barrier and enabler to select um, potential behaviour change strategies. And we used uh, Susan Mickey's behaviour change matrix um, with, for the key, I guess, obvious reason that it provides a recommended behaviour change technique that's mapped uh, or linked to each um, of the TDF domains. So for example, um, you can see up there um, for the domain of beliefs about consequences, um, the uh, recommended behaviour change techniques are self-monitoring, persuasive communication um, and providing information regarding the behaviour and outcome and feedback. So this slide provides an overview of, I guess, the resulting intervention and um, what it is attempting to demonstrate is the links between um, the suggested behaviour change techniques that fall um, or are linked to each of the identified domains and then get, give you a sense of how these were incorporated um, and operationalised within the implementation strategies. Um, so broadly the intervention included training, so provision of a full day training workshop for cooks and nominated supervisors, in addition to provision of uh, follow up support, so to, uh, to follow-up uh, on-site visits in it, um, as well as having an allocated support officer over the duration of the interview uh, intervention. Um, in addition to provision of uh, ordinate feedback, so a review of service menus with feedback report provided on two occasions, and strategy uh, resources and strategies to secure executive um, support. So if I just have, pick out um, the domain beliefs about consequences, so barriers and enablers that were identified for this domain, um, the recommended um, behaviour change techniques uh, that were selected for inclusion were those of monitoring and feedback. Um, and these were, uh, I guess, operationalised by um, the order and feedback implementation strategies, as I mentioned, uh, the menu at two time points and also um, uh, looking at um, having service managers uh, sign MOU and building um, documentation around um, providing feedback to the cook in relation to these reports. Okay, so uh, the intervention um, was implemented over a six month period and it was evaluated by a, a randomised cluster randomised control trial that was conducted with 45 childcare services. Um, and we evaluated the impact of the intervention on uh, menu compliance. So our primary outcomes were change in uh, full menu compliance and we also looked at individual food group uh, compliance. We also looked at outcomes around uh, child food consumption and in the TDF 
domains that were targeted by the intervention. So in terms of the findings, um, what we observed that there were no services at baseline that had menus that were fully compliant with um, each guideline, so all guidelines over uh, the two weeks of their menus that were assessed. Um, at follow-up, we had one uh, service in the, in, in the intervention groups that moved to full compliance um, and you know none from the uh, control group and this finding wasn't significant. However, when we looked at individual food groups, we did see some um, changes in regards to compliance for three of the six targeted food groups, so fruit, um, meat um, and non foods. Um, similarly for child food consumption, we did observe some significant improvements in um, intake of veg and fruit uh, food groups. Um, however, we didn't see any significant differences in uh, the theoretical domains framework targeted by the intervention. Okay, so I'm just now finishing up on some of the, the challenges, I guess, that we encountered as part of um, the process of applying uh, the TDF to this intervention um, process. And um, I guess firstly, it was in the steps around identifying the determinants. So um, this is an incredibly comprehensive step and it's a crucial step um, as part of applying the TDF, but it does require considerable investment of time and resources in order to complete it. Um, in regards to the actual uh, TDF domains, um, based on some other work that we have been doing, which has been conducting uh, literature reviews of or systematic reviews of um, barriers to uh, implementation. We've identified through the mapping process that a large majority of uh, the barriers and enablers map to certain domains and this is particularly true for the uh, domain of environmental context and resources and this may be an indication that um, in these particular settings these domains might be a little bit too broad. Um, in regard to measurement, um, just Absolutely, practically, the full survey, TDF survey, is very long. Um, so it's it's um, a long survey to, to fill out. It can be quite um, repetitive. Um, so that's uh, an issue in terms of participant burden. Um, we did, um, in our evaluation um, of the TDF domains, we observed that um, there might be some issues in relation to our application of it in regard to sensitivity. So some of the scores were high and this could indicate a possible uh, ceiling effect and this impacted, may have impacted on our ability to detect meaningful changes in those outcomes. And I guess this uh, represents that tricky space where you're trying to balance um, the, the need to have high behavioural specificity within the kind of TDF questions um, so that you can maximise the ability to identify uh, the determinants, but also to keep them generalisable enough so that um, they can be relevant to a, a range of different contexts. Um, and finally, uh, and obviously the findings of um, no significance for the um, uh, TDF domains might be an indication um, that the intervention could have exerted its effect through other pathways that we uh, didn't measure or don't know about. Um, and the, the framework that we used, um, so the Nikki's uh, frame behaviour change matrix for mapping the determinants to strategies at the moment, the recommendations within that are currently based on consensus, so um, they're not um, empirically supported. Um, yes. Uh, thanks very much for getting on a great presentation to finish up, and thanks to all our presenters. I thought those were outstanding presentations on a really wide variety of different projects using various frameworks. Um, and we are meant to be starting the panel discussion now, but I think we should have a five minute break so that people can go to the toilet and just walk around a bit and wake up. Um, so uh, why don't we do that if you're back here at 20 past the latest um, and we'll get the Zoom chair set up in the front so you guys can ask some questions. Um, Dee, if you want to kick us off with a question from you guys. Regarding TDF full length participant survey, are there validated shorter versions of the TDF survey? And I've, I've developed two, um, one's for physical activity, and then the other one is in the context of guideline implementation. But the way I've developed it is so that you can insert whatever target behaviour change you're looking to address. Um, there's 23 questions, it takes less than five minutes to complete, and it assesses each domain, but from the 11 domain TDF, not the 14 one. 
Um, can I just clarify that a little while before I put my own maybe blue book like that and comment that afterwards? But is, is that the difference between the TDFI that you were talking about and the TDFI? No. Can you just explain um, that a bit more? Yeah, so the, the, the TDFI encompasses the 11 domain TDF in terms of the barrier assessment and the mapping of the intervention strategies to those barriers. Um, but the TDFI, I suppose, just encompasses a lot of implementation principles along the six steps that um, the TDF itself by itself doesn't really include. At the time of developing the TDFI, there wasn't the behaviour change wheel book um, and all of the resources that were coming along with that. So I was kind of just trying to use what evidence was available and my own experiences of trying to implement these guidelines in practice just using what the TDF had to offer. Um, and then obviously as time has gone on, other people, including Susan Mickey herself, have developed a whole bunch of resources. So we tried to develop a uh, short version of the TDF. So we have five data sets. Um, and during item reduction, we found the data was too skewed um, to do rash analysis, so it couldn't actually reduce the scale. Um, uh, so we failed. So I have to look you up. Now. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, we did. We we used some um, confirmatory factor analysis to to develop the model, and then we used like the second half of the data to validate the model. Um, but also the questionnaire data sets. Um, it's not perfect, um, and there, there, sort of, there are some issues with discriminant validity, particularly if you look, you know, it's, it's still kind of rated, the, the reviewers of the, of the journals, the uh, articles still rated as valid enough, but I would say by no means it's perfect. Um, questions from the audience? Uh, oh. Um, I have a very basic one. I'm a framework novice, and in hearing about all these different frameworks, I'm just one hand really attracted to this, but the, the apparent simplicity of free aim, and then I'm struggling with some of the, comp the more complex um, after 24 domains of TDF, DI or whatever. Um, so, is there a reason why then some people use? Um, oh, what would be the reason why some people use, let's say, one framework or the other? Is it driven by the, the exposure historically of what they learned, or is it kind of a, a reason that one framework can't do what another does? Um, um, do you uh, happen to see the, the framework's review paper that was um, made available? So that would actually be a that would actually be a really good one to, to turn to because it does give them a review of. Other frameworks, but there, um, you know, some some are are, are more models for, for intervention development, and um, some some include intervention development as, as well as assessment, like the, the um, TDF, and then others like the REIN framework are, are more of just an evaluation framework. So, um, it, it, yeah, it, it comes down to I mean what you've been exposed to, but also what we were talking about before, taking those frameworks or those pieces of frameworks that, that work particularly. Well, um, I mean, I was, I've been kind of debating whether I would say what's in my head or not at the conference, but given that we're amongst friends, I, I don't know. And I, you know, perhaps have been old enough now and have been around in the field for long enough to, to kind of give the, you know, my own progression and historical perspective. Um, you know, I try to use a psychologist as a, as a health psychologist, and, and so I was once very much into the deal of the, the, the detail of, of framework development measurement tool and validation and, and the longer I've been in this and the more I've moved towards implementation scientists, the, the less I, I find and I don't mean this critical at all because I think that the word to develop the frameworks is, is, is important but for, for me personally in their application and in, in, in an implementation space I find that detail um, hard or <laughs> not and I guess I, I increasingly in the implementation space when you're actually on, on the ground trying to, to do something, to make something happen and evaluate it in a service delivery context, I, I find the, the, you know, the, the intricacy and the detail of, of some of these frameworks, I don't find it as, as helpful. And, and thus, for me, I, I've stuck with reading because it, it, it is more simple and, and pragmatic. 
I absolutely applaud Mitchie and, and the work with the people that are doing to further develop and actually test them and validate these, these frameworks. Um, you know, for, for me personally, in the implementation space, I just I moved away from it, you know, for for that reason. Anyone else want to comment on that? Uh, sorry, I will just say one more thing. I, I thought it was, it was really interesting the series of, of talks we had because, but, but, and I don't know if you, you sort of organized it this way, but, but for me, the talks were a progression of um, use of, of, of the frameworks and models more, almost more as a heuristic in terms of development, but, but not you know, slavishly to every detail, pretty to all the way what was you know, presented by your group. And again, not at all criticism, just an observation of really being true to the framework, including trying to use the validated measures and tools. And you know, thus my observation for many years in the field, every time we take it to that nth degree and really try to be true to the framework, and this is, you know, this is those of you who work within every number of stages of change, it was kind of the same thing. When when you really address that detail, one, the assessments are so burdensome. And, and two, when, when you do a good job actually assessing, they often fall over in terms of their predictive you know, validity. And, and so I, I thought we really saw you know, a very nice example of, of, of that here. And it, and it is in no way a criticism of, of the work being done or, the, or, or, or a statement of the appropriate use of the frameworks. It's just stuff is easy. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Um, I think I have another question over here. Yes. Um, to all of the panel, I'm um, working in a busy health service, and I was wondering what you use to help clinicians, particularly, keep their eyes on the prize. So we've got so many demands and clinical business and all sorts of um, innovations at various um, levels from the ministry down to working with their clients. Um, what what you do to deal with that and help facilitate them to focus on whatever implementation project you're working And also, I think Natalie referred to, um, well, not referred directly to, but alluded to the kind of validity versus expediency um, that, that is sort of with health services, there's always expediency, and, that, and that's always. Going to bring the validity of a lot of these implementation models into um, query. So I was just wondering what you had to say about that. Perhaps the panel might want to pick up on as well. I think uh, what Natalie referred to in, in terms of explaining these models to clinicians and, and being like, how have you done that? Yeah, that's a great question because the, the clinical environment is very busy. Um, the thing you always ask the patient is how we uh, keep people's eyes on the prize because everybody wants people who live with cancer to have their pain controlled. Um, and so we just keep bringing it back. And the, one of our interventions is all the feedback and we show clinical teams um, what the outcomes are and if, you know, lots of people have um, high pain scores, and that's really my aim for the clinical teams to actually know how we need to be doing what we're doing better. Um, we also have clinical champions at every part of the clinical process. Um, so uh, within the, the medical nursing administration and so on. Uh, and we have little reminders and incentives. Um, one of our interventions is Q-Stream education. And we have a leaderboard so people can see who's doing really well in that. We have prizes for those who who win, and so just lots of little things that we try to keep people focused. I was just going to say, I, I think if you're actually really wanting to engage in a piece of reform, and that's often what we want to do, if you actually really need to engage certain political leaders or people that are really going to be quite influential in driving the change early, and give clinicians a sense that they're contributing, co-partnering, and I think if you looked at any of the slides, just even the introduction, the acknowledgement of the partnerships, um, I think many of the people, my colleagues sitting on the panel, 
really exist. I'm like that. that they have really reached out and partnered with a variety of people and engaging with them. So I think somebody else um, presenting, and forgive me for having an option, who mentioned that often people want to jump straight to the intervention. And I think that's the biggest trap in health today. And I must say, that's why another reason I think about these conceptual models, and that's the other point I want to make. These are conceptual models, um, other than niches, and I'm not familiar enough with the theoretical domains frankly, to comment on that. But the rest, like in terms of talking about the model I've spoken about with the class, they're actually conceptual ideas about our understanding of the elements that we think are important for driving change. So, in some respects, I, going back to um, your best question, I sometimes think about these frameworks or conceptual, almost like you probably would you buy words. I can only imagine words in the way you read that and think about the mouse models. You've got some, you know, you've got some signals, but they're not necessarily all proven, but they're there to help guide us. And I think we need to stress that to physicians. And there's just a, a few things that we did. So as part of this approach, we gathered together implementation teams. So they did have some senior clinicians, but then people spanning across the whole process of whatever you know what we were trying to change. So even down to you know, administrative staff because of the influences that they might have on these particular processes in the system. The other thing that we did was we process mapped with these clinicians so that they could first of all tell us what they did and and then we could compare that to the guidelines but then also audited their practice and mapped that across to the process map so they could see firsthand exactly what they were doing and where the gaps were so that that helped us to get the buy-in for them to actually identify acknowledge that there was a problem with what they were doing um, and then the, the third thing was to produce you know kind of reports data filled reports with you know, they're, they're all the data, the key barriers that we, we found and the interventions that they had developed. So we, we were always trying to go back to the fact that they owned the project and it wasn't us driving it. Um, and I think some of those things have helped in the past. Yeah, we have a, a double part question from the parcel. What strategies are used during the intervention phase to support the day to day challenges when implementing? And following on from that, are there any frameworks that weren't talked about today that might be better for this? First question again, please. Yeah. What strategies are used during the intervention phase to support the day to day challenges when implementing? Alex, you should be your new people. Getting on the ground and doing it. <laughs> so basically, Modeling, I think, is something that's really key. Um, and, and particularly in our study, which is trying to introduce screen, well, as part of the control, but also part of the intervention, we need to screen for pain. Um, it is about getting out there, standing around, doing the screening, and then being able to report back those stories like um, I did today on the importance of screening. And I think just yeah, that's how you work day to day, um, just reminding people of what they're there for all the time. So. Oh, it's really more a theoretical comment, and um, it struck me because just the work we've been doing on the Stop Pain project. The other thing is, like, even though every and Melanie Stop me if you don't want me to say this. Even though we have tested every element we've integrated into the intervention, we've still encountered problems and challenges, I should say, challenges. And they weren't apparent in the piloting. And one of the things I've reflected on in terms of the piloting is that we actually did them where we had senior investigators at their sites. So there are different drivers, I think, that operated in the pilot that enabled the pilot probably to go smoother. And now we've gone out to sites 
we still have friendly on-site investigators, but we are operating in a different environment. And I think perhaps we hadn't really thought about that as being a factor. Um, I guess I, I would say, I, mean, I don't think there's a generic set of strategies that you can use, but I think in terms of the process, um, the whole co-production process is probably key. So the more you can understand about the context of where you're, where you're trying to implement the intervention, um, the more you go with the momentum and, and, and don't try to introduce uh, uh, things that go against usual processes or practices within the clinic or the hospital or the, the childcare centre that you're working in, um, often the easier these processes become. And the idea of kind of harnessing TAS technology, um, which is, a, I think, the, the concept that um, Matt brought up is kind of critical. Often clinicians will know how to solve these problems and if you kind of walk in and, and tell them that what they're doing wrong and that, that you have a solution from them, um, it's actually really hard to get them to play ball with you. Um, so I guess that would, having a really good understanding of context, which you can only get by being there, by observing seeing the patient journey, um, seeing how people, seeing how much time people have or other competing priorities they've got, um, or the things they need to attend to. Um, in terms of uh, so frameworks, I think there was a, a, a paper published in the Implementation Science a couple of days ago. I think there's 60 plus um, frameworks from Implementation Science at the moment. And Trish Greenhull um, tweeted in response to that, that um, you know, these models are like toothbrushes, everyone's got one that no one wants to use anyone else's. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I think, I think you can find a framework to suit because they're that. Great, thanks so much, Dr. John. Thank you. I might read some of these. I'm uh, just a, a humble clinical nurse consultant with no background in implementation science. Uh, I work with a population of people who treat drugs who have complex comorbid health and support needs, and I want to implement an intervention to improve the capacity of the service I work at to refer people for treatment and uh, the support as needed. There are many barriers to the complex nature of the service I work in, the environmental space, um, the structures, the policies, and the diverse nature of staff that work there, attitudes, motivations, performance indicators, and so on. And the question is, how do I go about choosing a framework to implement my intervention? And how do I use that framework? How do I utilize that framework to identify appropriate um, interventions? Thank you. So it is, it is a good question. And in terms of thinking about what your intervention is, there, there are lots of great um, ways of looking at the whole program. So the MRC complex interventions framework is what we use when we initially started our whole program. So our program started with you know digital use, stakeholder surveys, guideline development, you know, the full the full thing. So so that's a really helpful over, overview. Um, you are working in a complex environment, and so something that takes into, into account all those things is, is very helpful. Um, so the development of the intervention is one thing, and then the, the overall um, approach to how to make it work in the context is, is the other. And I think one of the, I don't know whether others would agree, but, but um, choosing a framework and going with it, I think is quite, I mean, because you could spend a lot of time getting bogged down in choosing frameworks, mm -hmm. but actually, it's what you want to do is have a theoretical framework so you don't miss things, but that actually you want to start rather than getting right through. Yeah. I was just saying that I'm sorry, I've got no idea. I just don't know which one might keep passing. It's a big task to take up on your own. So, like, I would recommend you think about, you know, somebody who's passionate about frameworks that might want to partner with you, you know, and make that easier for you because if you're coming into it, you don't know anything about it, you know, it's like picking one off the rack is going to be difficult. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it might be a great partnership with people who want to work out and have to get some industry experience and work out in a real world setting. So, you know, I would suggest looking at right something to find with you. So it's passionate about the frameworks here. 
I was going to just read it, the first one actually that it's always, I don't know that it actually matters that much which one you choose, as long as you use one to guide you, and then maybe a simpler one is better if it's something that you're not familiar with. Um, I think the thing that not only here, but at other implementation conferences and speaking with people in the implementation world is that different constructs have different names, but essentially they're quite often the same thing. Um, you know, so we're all using different labels for things, but we're essentially still talking about the same barriers or the same behaviors. So I would just find something that makes sense to you intuitively. You probably use that word for struggle or something that's complicated that you, know, you just can't operationalize. <laughs> and which are the simple ones? <laughs> I mean, I, I would say that this, you have a really good handle on the drivers. And, and so, I mean, look at the frameworks. And, and, and the one that, that to you says, yeah, that actually addresses some things that I know to be true about the context. It doesn't have extraneous things, or if it has extraneous things, extract those bits that you know, make most sense. And as Louise alluded to before, um, I'm not sure if everyone saw it, but there was a paper sent out as kind of pre-reading this that, that, that is an overview of all the different theories, um, models, and frameworks available. So just having a read through that might help you gain, you know, short list a couple of these. But, but because they make sense to you, that, that's fine. Yeah. 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 Hi, I'm Nikki Percival from UTS. Um, thank you very much for a wonderful um, array of frameworks, particularly the real world setting and getting understanding of how this will apply. Um, I work in the context of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health, and I'm wondering whether you can reflect on. I have my own toothbrush because of that. Um, I've developed an implementation framework. But um, one of the things I'm really struck by is that these frameworks are very cost centric and they've been developed in that context. I'm wondering, particularly, Jill, maybe you want to reflect on your use of the behaviour channel, but others as well. Some of the frameworks actually don't pick up things around history and colonisation and cultural competence and these sort of things that actually have a really big um, uh, effect on whether or not an intervention will work in the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander context. So I'm wondering whether you can reflect on whether you think that they do, or what the gaps are, and um, whether they have actually captured the person. Mm. Um, I, I think this brings me to something I've been thinking about listening to the presentation. It's also, you know, this kind of mix between the framework and the intuitive and the stuff that you, you know, that's really hard to capture. And I think that's what I was hinting about about uh, this iterative process and it not being linear. Because we, it, the framework we've been using has been a bit behind the scenes like a blueprint in a way. It's not something we've really gone to the community and discussed the framework and how we're using it. It's more like we've taken that knowledge, we've taken it back, we've tried to make sense of things. But like the whole, all the cultural context kind of come into everything. So the decisions about then how you do things and how you make that culture appropriate. Say, for example, we're developing our resources um, for, um, you know, say, the Open Women, you know, this book clutch. But we, we had a first go at producing some brochures that we made sure they had all the messages that had come from previous literature um, that seemed to be important, you know, from literature for the um, Indigenous sector, you know, in Australia, not, you know, not the, general population so much that had all those three messages in there, but then we took those out and we worked with them um, with communities locally and then we tested them in with three different focus groups and we changed and adapted and made something different and brought in what we really want, wanted. So how you capture that in the framework? You know, we have this kind of thing behind the scenes which we've talked about, but it, on the ground, there was a lot of intuitive decisions and a lot of uh, working today, together collaboratively. So we didn't kind of plug that whole, oh, we're doing this here and we're building on this type of behavior change we are here. That was all more just behind the scenes guiding our thinking so that we wanted to make sure we, you know, the gaps that we knew about were covered. But there was a lot of intuitive stuff that could be captured. And it's really hard to write that down. It was, I was just about to say, really important to to the limitations of some of these frameworks in helping guide research and practitioners to think about implementation in that context because that's what we found. We use the Paris framework and the CFIR and all those, and they 
they don't guide you to say what are the real nuances and what the conditions are. It's only because we work in the emissions of context that we know that that's really important, but it's actually not reflected in the literature. Yes, yes, that's true. And I've just written a paper that's um, hopefully going to be under review, and it probably didn't sort of address that. I could have had a whole section on that. It's yes. now you're just saying it, you know, for, you know, the fact is important. It's kind of interwoven and assumed. But like if somebody else is coming from the outside, not done that before, not worked with um, another culture before, or, you know, how do they address those cultural contexts and bring them in? Um, that, I mean, it does come down to context. And I mean, there's a whole lot of frameworks around context that are so much as well, which I don't think is really quite interesting. Yeah. But I'd love to see your framework. Yeah. I want to just ask a quick question about it. it sounds like there's been various levels of kind of uh, adherence or usage of frameworks in the, in the different projects uh, outlined today. Uh, I'm wondering how much detail you put in your original grants and that kind of thing about the framework you're using and whether that was a selling point for your. Um, for your application, or, or whether it was something that you just kind of you know, put in there to tick the box and kind of what's the next thing? Well, I, just because I've got my, I think it is important to put it in there. We did, you know, so, but you, you know, you don't have a lot of space in most grants, you know, to go into that. I mean, people are probably going to, you know, it's maybe a paragraph um, on, on what, you know, what frameworks you're using. And I suppose at the beginning, you don't. So um, I think one of the things I tend to notice is that people use the frameworks a lot for the front end for the development, maybe the implementation, but not so much for the other end of actually evaluating the project at the end. Um, I'm, I'm part of the context, the concepts and context um, committee of global knowledge and global disease. We just recently did a survey across um, the global survey across the projects that are part of the global alliance for the disease. And that we, that's what we're finding that people are mostly not using um, the, the frameworks at the end to evaluate that program. So, okay. 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 Um, in the most recent grant that I put together, I tried <coughs> to demonstrate that it was not just the framework but and, and the kind of passion of the researchers that use the framework but we needed to equip the people on the ground with the skills to implement the framework themselves so i've, I've sort of changed tack a bit recently but rather than us being the research team that go in and do absolutely everything we, we train people in the approach whether it's the tdf tdfi pcc and equip them with the skills and the resources to be able to to implement things themselves and then also to act as a hub of support so the research team are the ones with the expertise about the theory and, and the and implementation to a certain degree but they have the context based knowledge they have the contacts that you know the ease to get somebody to sign an ethic form to get things through the system to get people together all the relevant people together and i think trying to, i'm trying to find that balance now um, <laughs> yeah, tell us when they figure it out. <laughs> um, I wanted to kind of get down to the level of interventions and a number of frameworks and models talked about, um, you know, the extent to which there was adherence to the intervention, I think, as you talked about, 11 out of 12 sessions were mostly given, etc. And I, I know from research that um, that's one of the critical things, if you're not adhering to the intervention as it was trialled to get less of an effect. But some of it seems subjective and also how do we feed that back to the people delivering the intervention on the ground, the people who are trying to change their behaviour in a way that isn't demoralising in a sense and saying you're not quite doing it right. Um, so maybe just if anyone's got comments from their experiences of doing that. So I think that's quite a critical thing. Thank you.
Firstly, I was just going to speak about um, the community of practice that we've developed for like within our internet, within our trial. Um, I think that that's been a really valuable for each of the sites to actually get together and to get an understanding that they're not alone in some of the barriers that they're encountering and learn from other sites uh, what's been what's happened and how they've overcome each of those uh, potential barriers. So I think that that's been um, important for, for each of the sites to, uh, yeah, so that's what I was going to say. I think you've raised a really important point because we often see that these interventions actually fail and when they're across multiple sites, we're not really sure whether if it's the same, if you think about it, an intervention like a drug, then it's it's much harder to control the dose at each site. And I think we actually really need to have systems in place to be able to do that. And I know that's a conversation that we often have with the team um, within our unit. There's not necessarily a lot of really good resources to do that. But I must say I found it helpful in Alison and Melanie prevent um, possession of the Paris framework. And just by monitoring actually what's happening at each site in terms of the implementation and evaluating the effect of you know the degree to which the intervention and the way it's designed is actually being implemented and identifying what we're bumping up against, I think has been helpful in terms of really just capturing some of that data which potentially would have been lost without actually superimposing that framework on the intervention. Because effectively that's really just monitoring what's actually happening at the site. Um, and I think it's in, provided incredible insight which probably would have been lost and, and or forgotten as we move to the next site. But there is, if you want to develop um, something that would contribute that, it's a really important thing, I think, um, to be doing this around capturing the degree to which things are being implemented in the way they're meant to be. Um, yeah, I would agree with that. We had um, a whole range of tracking and monitoring systems in place, what we did, which was how we could present some of the sort of feedback to the sites on how they were adhering to the processes. I think it's a really important point because actually through that monitoring and through our analysis, we actually found that the sites that adhered the most closely with what well, was one that was particularly good was the only site that actually had a significant effect on the primary outcome. Whereas the others where they kind of tailed off or adapted things, that we didn't see the same effect at all. Yeah, and it's a challenge, um, you know, in some respects, some of the studies we've been doing have there's a degree of pragmatism and when you're working with clinicians you sometimes find yourself between a rock and a hard place and as a clinician I suppose you have quite, I'm not saying other people don't, but so I have great empathy for the reality of the clinical space but I think the point you raise is you know quite crucial which we wouldn't just give half a dose of something or break off the drug and not give the full dose and effectively that's what we're doing in those sites. I think we're we're a little bit over time. I'm going to take one final question from you guys if that's okay and leave the rest of them for the discussion at lunchtime, which I'm sure you're all looking forward to. So question Do you see cost effectiveness of an intervention as a barrier or a enabler to implementation reach and maintenance? I think that the, our uh, ability to, to speak to the, the cost effectiveness of an intervention is, is really important. So, um, you know, economists are, are rare um, when, when we're fortunate enough to you know, have access to one or have a health economist on our team. I think being able to provide those data um, are, are important. It's really only a barrier to the extent that it's you know, difficult to access that resource, but, but important to speak to those who are going to be allocating resources um, towards continuing any, any of these programs or interventions. Yeah, 
platforms. Good. Just, one quick just, just to comment about possible overwhelm, you know, that the services experience when we're trying to, you know, change these complex things. And I just um, kind of heard a few people say that. And I don't know kind of what, you know, it's trying to get down to the, you know, streamline what are the most important simple things that we can do. Um, I don't have an answer for that, but it's just something I I've heard that several people mentioned, you know, so maybe it's got any ideas. <laughs> <laughs> streamline things, let me know. Um, well, I'd just like to finish up by thanking all the uh, presenters today and um, everyone for coming, including the people who have joined in from Newcastle. Uh, hopefully, this has helped kind of demystify choosing and using a implementation framework to some degree, and we've heard some really great examples of how these frameworks have been applied in practice. So thanks again. Um, enjoy your lunch and um, hope to see you at the next event like this.